at this time um, I would like to this is just a, a formal formality uh, I'm going to resign as chairman and um, nominate uh, Commissioner Hamachek to be chairman so Mr. Young would you second that I will second that okay all in favor yes I Aye. Okay. and by way of background if I could procedurally when we've constituted who was going to be chairing I acquiesced to the experienced member of the board tradition uh, and apparently custom uh, that the treasurer is normally not the chair so that's why it's coming to the president of the board of commissioners just if anybody's wondering what in the world's going on so okay. just wanted to get a little bit of background no, you need to nominate me a and yeah I suppose I should now thank you yeah. that's why she's really keeping things going see now I would like to make a motion nominating Lorraine Fendi our treasurer as secretary please I will second that all in favor aye aye okay now that we tied up all that good stuff right okay so we've got our roll call out of the way we've got our now we have our uh, meeting minutes uh, of the January 28th 2021 meeting uh, can we waive the reading thereof and approve same? Second that. I'll move to do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, all the, we're good legal. At, we're uh, we have a first from Ms. Fendi and Commissioner Young, you second that? Uh, yes. So with that said, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, opposed? Very good, since there aren't anybody any left. Uh, I guess this is the part where we could uh, segue into, do we have any old business to come before us? Any old business? None indicated. Moving on to new business, I think the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. I hope I gotta get that on. There we go. There you go. <laughs> Always forget that. <laughs> yes, that critical step, right? Indeed. <laughs> um, but here on draft day, here we are. Um, you know, some unfortunate weather, and I think it's very indicative of, um, you know, how this year so far has gone a lot of uh, good news but then um, things just not always um, moving quick enough to probably that perfect environment so we are clearly at this point of what I would call an inflection point uh, as it relates to um, the transition the rebounding of the US economy post pandemic and the uh, movement of interest rates so as we have discussed previously um, you know the US economy is uh, driven very much so by the US consumer so US the uh, US consumer is uh, a very important component to this and if we look at our uh, presentation here on page two um, we can see looking at the levels of consumer spending that on the blue line they have returned to pre COVID levels however Again, we have this trend of the uh, consumer spending um, being uh, concentrated in the goods sector. And of course, this is a continuation of the um, slow return to a pre-COVID economy um, where folks are continuing to uh, spend their dollars on goods as opposed to services. And we can see that in the gray line with the level of consumer spending in the service sector remaining depressed uh, relative to where it was uh, pre-pandemic. And this um, lower level of uh, service spending is you know, partially also um, a reflection of the fact that many of the areas of the service industry have not been able to return back to 100% either capacity or completely reopen. Um, clearly, when we think in terms of the service sector, much of that is the small business area, as well as just the leisure and hospitality uh, sectors. Um, so when we flip to the next page and we look at the employment picture, um, again, we kind of have a, a good news, not so great news story here, in that jobs have um, returned to some degree, but we have not regained jobs to the extent that we had lost as a result of uh, the initial shutdowns. So at this stage, we still have about 8 million Americans who are still unemployed. And that is feeding into the Fed's message and commitment to keeping interest rates lower for longer. Uh, because the Fed's um, has, a, a, has a mandate from their congressional authority, uh, which dictates that they um, 
must move to uh, assist the U.S. economy to achieve full employment. And so full employment, in their view, has been uh, identified as getting the unemployment rate back down to where it was previously, which is around 3.5%. We're currently at 6%. Um, but additionally, they've expanded that definition to include a concept uh, referred to as maximum employment, which means employment across the various wage classes. So when we look at the um, the employment levels for what are classified as high wage earners, which are folks earning more than 60000 per year, uh, those employment levels are back to where they were pre-pandemic. But when we look at the lower wage earners, which are those earning less than 24000 per year, those employment levels are still around 20% below pre-pandemic levels. So again, the ability of the service sector to reopen and to um, re-employ folks uh, will certainly go a long way to um, the U.S. economy returning back to full employment and additionally maximum employment. And that will then allow the Fed to um, start to um, consider or start to actually move on raising those short-term interest rates. Now, if we look at the next page with the U.S. Treasury yield curves, this gives us an indication of where uh, U.S. Treasury rates are across the maturity spectrum. Uh, the blue line is the level of interest rates as of the end of March. Um, the gray line is as of the end of 2019, uh, which we would ca characterize as, you know, pre-pandemic, um, and the end of 2020, of course, is just a reference to where rates were uh, when we last uh, presented here. But we can see looking at the blue line, the longer term rates have increased and pretty much are, from a longer term perspective are pretty close to where they were back in 2019. Um, and this is reflective of the market um, having optimism that the U.S. economy is on track to return to normal, that the global picture will get there as well, and that the prospect for increased inflation um, is perhaps on the horizon. Uh, the steepness of the yield curve, meaning that the short-term interest rates are very anchored to zero, the, as we go out the maturity spectrum, those rates are higher, that steepness is reflected, reflective of the fact that the Fed is keeping those short-term interest rates anchored in that 0 to 0.25% range. But yet, as I said, the market is also anticipating that the Fed will be in a position to start to uh, return those rates back to normal. And so when we think in terms of what is normal and what, is, what has the Fed communicated to the marketplace as it relates to when that may occur, we can look to the next page, which is the forecast that the Federal Reserve does uh, issue on a quarterly basis. They do meet eight times a year, but they only issue a forecast four times a year. And as a matter of fact, they just wrapped up a two-day meeting yesterday. Um, but this forecast from March is the most current one. Uh, that we have to get a feel for really what are what are they projecting for the U.S. economy, uh, not only for the uh, GDP, which is a measure of economic activity, but the unemployment rate and the inflation uh, rate, and then as well as where they um, expect that that short-term interest rate will be. And so we can see looking at under 2021, 22, and 23, um, that the Fed is clearly expecting, as I think many market participants are, that 2021 will be um, a year of inc very much so increased economic activity, well above trend levels. And when we think of trend levels, historically, the US economy has expanded at a rate of around 25 to 3%. Um, in 2021, uh, at least the Fed's expectations are that we will be at 6.5%. Um, I believe the first quarter 2021 GDP numbers perhaps came out while I was in the car driving, <laughs> um, but I know the expectations were for the first quarter um, that it would be in excess of 6%. Um, so clearly, you know, 2021 being... Um, Rather, a return of economic activity, um, a release of some pent-up demand uh, as it related to the, fo the fact that, you know, through 2020, um, economic activity was rather um, depressed. Uh, but go looking ahead to 2022 and 2023, um, the expectations are that growth will return back to these trend levels. Um, 
The unemployment rate, when we look at the Fed's forecast, we can see they're projecting that in 2021 unemployment will only drop to 4.5%. Um, so still some ways to go till it meets their uh, mandate of full employment. And they're not expecting that to occur until we um, get into 2023. Uh, which correlates with the Fed's expectations that they have communicated that they will keep interest rates uh, on the short end um, on hold through 2023. Now, we want to always consider that this is a forecast and 2023 is two years from now, and a lot can change um, you know, between that time. But certainly, um, you know, with what we know today, it doesn't seem unreasonable that the Fed would move any time uh, significantly sooner, particularly since the expectations are that inflation will also um, may have a, a, a bit of a spike here in 2021, but will settle back down to uh, trend levels as well. So that being said, you know, as we look at the uh, county's investment portfolio, um, this would be as of the end of March. And we can see that um, you know, the securities portion uh, was 146 um, million. Um, the portfolio was yielding 0.99, uh, which is unchanged from where it was at the end of December. And when we compare that rate, um, that yield on the investment portfolio to other investment options that the county would have, such as an overnight account uh, with the Star Ohio investment pool, which has been earning around 0.08%, uh, um, we can clearly see that the, there's been this benefit of a longer term investment plan. Um, the portfolio has a weighted average maturity of a little over two years, 2.39 years. And so again, if we were to compare that portfolio yield, say to a two-year U.S. Treasury, um, a two-year U.S. Treasury this morning was yielding around 0.16%. So that gives us really an idea of how low those shorter-term interest rates are um, and the value to have been, a been able to invest uh, funds longer term. And that's exhibited when we look at the maturity distribution and we can see the uh, funds that are available within the investment portfolio maturing within a year, a year to two years, and so forth. And we can also see the yields um, that are um, associated with those securities in those um, those maturity buckets. So from a strategy standpoint, our objective would be um, uh, to maintain um, around 40% of the investment portfolio maturing beyond three years. That will can allow us to take advantage of that steepness in the yield curve where the market has already priced in um, optimism. Um, and limit uh, the amount of reinvestment here in the shorter term as interest rates remain uh, very uh, low and we anticipate will continue to do so. Um, so that being said, um, are there any questions, comments? I do have, I do have a, a question or two. Sure. Um, you know, the, you mentioned the service sector. Mm -hmm. uh, empl employment has not returned, mm -hmm. bounced back as quickly as other sectors. Um, historically, the service sector's um, average income per employee generally has trailed other sectors yes. for a number of reasons. Um, could that, tr could that uh, lack of a bounce back mm -hmm. as far as employment levels be, are concerned be somewhat the result of overly enthusiastic government uh, benevolence, <laughs> if you will. Um, and is there any, are there, are there any studies uh, that would indicate that, um, if, if that's the case? Yeah, and, and I think that's a very good point. And I know, um, just anecdotally, uh, just you know, in my circle of, um, you know, we know of many f folks who own small businesses and, and the common theme we have heard is that people, you know, small businesses are having to compete with unemployment benefits because the pandemic um, assistant, assistance benefits have provided folks with that bridge that they needed. Right. But at some point, right, the bridge has to be lowered and folks need to be able to be in a position to return to work. So it's a delicate balance, I think, as far as how do you 
how will right the federal at the federal level will they um, remove that assistance and small businesses and the service sector be in a position to be able to hire all of those people. Um, it's my understanding the uh, pandemic assistance um, is has a sunset provision, which of course has continued to be extended. And the latest sunset provision, I believe, is um, the end of August. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I've not seen any particular studies where, right, they been able to identify um, you know, our folks not returning to work because they are receiving unemployment benefits. Um, just on an anecdotal side, um, I know of a friend of ours who owns a couple of restaurants, and when he was confronted with re reopening, even it reduced um, capacity, and he'd called people back. And, you know, some one person said, well, you know, why would I want to come back? I'm making money on unemployment. And he reported her to the unemployment office. And that guy apparently, and I don't know how that works, but the, so the story goes that, yeah, her unemployment was then stopped. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. I just, I mean, probably everybody in this room would, would say the same thing, yeah. that I've seen that time and time again recently on the news, that, yeah. you know, it, it's the service jobs and it's the restaurants and stuff like that that can't mm -hmm. find people. Everybody's right. looking for somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Sir. Um, Thank you, ma'am. We're, we're in a bit of a dilemma here. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, a number of our members, people related to the board, whatever, have uh, been suggesting that uh, we should bond a significant amount of money in order to, uh, for building projects. Um, do we have much in the way of reserves right now that uh, would allow us to, rather than, well, give me a quick comparison of bonding, uh, mm -hmm. say, 50 million for a 30 year period, as opposed to using some of these monies that we have invested right now that might be available within the next, say, six months. Um, I know that would cut into our future income. Mm -hmm. Would it cut into it as much as the interest rates well, that we'd be paying if we bonded the money? Well, and, and I think, you know, um, yeah, my focus is on when we talk about kind of the balance sheet. On one side of the balance sheet, which is the investment side versus the debt issuance side, which is the other side. Um, and I know that the county does I have someone who they work with on that side. So I can't really speak to how they determine when it's the appropriate uh, time or method how that works as far as borrowing additional monies. But I, I will say this, you know, clearly we are in an extremely low interest rate environment. Um, and so borrowing monies at these extremely low interest rate environments can have long term savings for many public entities or anyone who borrows. We see that in the housing market where folks you know, refinance their mortgages when rates are very low because they're able to then reduce their payment or extend their term or whatever and there's savings associated with that. Um, and that's a very long-term gain. The flip side is on the investment side, on my side, when we have, like we are having here, have had here over the past year, very low interest rates on the investment side, this is a more short-term loss of income, we would say, um, because as we can see, interest rates will eventually return to a higher level, and so the interest income that the county will earn will also react as well. Um, and again, this um, recession that we're in today is very different than the past recession, the housing crisis, where the housing crisis was, um, you know, a, a devastation of, a, of really clearly a whole industry. You know, everyone who was related to housing, and though it was very much so, um, a little more higher paying jobs. This is something that is, it's not that businesses have done anything wrong. They've just had to shut down. And so now as they reopen, things will get back 
should get back to normal. But insofar as how do you determine, right, how much we should borrow, yeah, that uh, I would say is um, best addressed through the, um, I think the city, I think the county uses a municipal advisor working with them. Of course, the money we have sitting there right now mm -hmm. that is not uh, invested long term, mm -hmm. those are monies that would have to be invested in the future uh, in order to get the, um, the higher interest rates, mm -hmm. uh, they'd have to be invested longer term. Right. So that's a bit of a gamble. But right now, mm -hmm. those monies are at what, what percentage, the sh real short-term stuff, what is it earning about? Uh, the Just a rough estimate. Um, well, currently with what's in the portfolio, it's yielding 0.72. There's a very short-term point holding. 0.72, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I don't know what the bonding rate is. Um, well, I can tell you that as we um, invest in municipal securities um, and municipal notes, and I, I know that the county, um, I think in the past quarter, did issue um, some notes in the marketplace. And as investors, we purchased some of those notes for some of our other clients as an investment. I want to say that the yield on those notes was around... 0.2 for one year. So that gives you an idea of, um, I th would say, perhaps borrowing rates um, out one year. Now, of course, longer, to, you know, generally when an entity borrows money, they do, they borrow those monies uh, over a longer period of time, some maturing shorter term. Um, they do it in what is called a series. So meaning, you know, some mature in 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years and the like. So okay. overall, um, at least from what we've seen, you know, longer term borrowing rates on a full series like that um, would be somewhere in the range of, you know, one and a half to two and a half percent. I see. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And if I can just follow up on that, I think it's very important. I, I believe that's a potentially clever and, and in, insightful way to uh, fund this but the dollars that are being invested are pooled dollars. Yes. Uh, the only thing that our general fund benefits from typically would be the interest is what goes to the general fund. The other dollars remain, uh, I'm gonna say the ownership of the entity. Like I'm pretty sure Deepwood would not appreciate our trying to do a definite purpose project um, using their monies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know we've got a coupon rate that's about 0.5 and yields 0.2. Um, I know that's been part of our discussion, but I, I don't believe that the treasurer would be open to having the treasurer's office being used as a lending institution. I, it, it seems like it'd be a great idea if we could pay a market rate back to ourselves, mm -hmm. but I don't believe we have, and I'm going to look to our legal on this, I'm, I'm not aware of any statutory authority that would allow us to do that. In fact, I think there are strict prohibitions. I would agree with that. I'm not aware uses. of any myself, so, Commissioner. It, that that might be something worth taking up though with the legislature to see if we could literally loan it to ourselves uh, and, and basically do something but I right now I know of no legal way to do what you just asked just I, I want that into the record that great idea but we'll we'd have to work with our state legislature to get uh, enabling authority to do that uh, treasurer on this is what, what are your thoughts um, just a, a quick comment that um, Looking at our portfolio, uh, it says that we have over 200 million in cash. We might have that, but we don't have that all to spend. I mean, mm -hmm. there's an, an example of this is there's 30 million dollars, roughly 30 million dollars in here that is mine to invest, but it, it does not, like um, Commissioner Hamanchik said, it does not belong to the county's general fund. That 30 million belongs to the utilities department, and they like to have. That, uh, that kind of income on hand where they have easy access to it within 24 hours in case there's a major, major emergency. So, there's, uh, so then there's no monies available to the county in, in any of this uh, portfolio, to the county as an entity. I'm I mean, not, it's, it's, I'm not gonna say yes and I'm not gonna say no because it's I, all, I, this it's was a question I wasn't, I certainly wasn't expecting that I would be more than yeah. happy to, to look into it for you, but if there's you could, not 50 million. If you, yeah, if, if you could uh, 
give us some idea of what actually might be available then. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I can do that. And I'm not looking necessarily, would it have to be a borrowing situation? I would imagine we'd if, have to make the fund whole. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine any scenario where we could benefit from it and not, what? although the, although let's think, let's talk this through, this is where public meetings come in. If we were making the fund whole and the interest is only coming back to the general fund, we're making the general fund, which is making the expense whole, that does seem like circular logic, which is why people with uh, far greater legal and financial uh, experience than me are going to have to give us some guidance. That, uh, yeah, right. there's, that's interesting. So you're not, a, you're not aware of any limitations? I'm not, Commissioner, but I would have to defer to bond counsel for the sure. county on that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a very uh, highly uh, detailed area of the law that I've not researched myself. Very good. All righty. Thank you. Thank interesting. You. Thank you. That, that's actually an, now, now you've got me thinking there, Ron. That's wow. That hmm. hmm. That, that, well, that's that, not. It's not a first, is it? Uh, <laughs> that you got me thinking, or <laughs> now, now, no, no, no. You, you've got me. Uh, you're, you're doing great. You've got me pondering it. That that's All an right. interesting. As long as it doesn't turn into coin gate, we'd be good. That, that's a very old reference, there, folks. It certainly is. I'm showing my age yes, yet again. You are. So, do we have any other new business to come before us today? None being heard, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Discussion. None being heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed. Very good. Thank you. We stand adjourned. And if you'll give us just a moment to clear the decks, we're going to roll into our commissioner meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I would be happy to. <laughs> there you go. Teamwork. Yeah, the one and only time. I didn't see her hand me anything. I'm sure she did. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. It's like printed the hard copies out. Okay. Okay. Okay, I believe we have all the chairs uh, manned and ready here. We good to go, gentlemen? IT, we're still up and running. Okay, so we will roll directly into saying thank you for joining us today for the 17th meeting of the Border Lake County Commissioners. Would all those who are willing and able please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Grant us, O Lord, light to our understanding, prudence in our investigating, foresight in our planning, sincerity in our deliberating, the grace to follow truth in our judgment. Help us to be moved in our decision, neither by fear nor by self-interest, and to do our work faithfully. May we respect the authority vested in us, for thou art the source of all authority, and may we use in our directives for the common good, and for thy honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Okay, Madam Clerk, roll call please. Commissioner Young. Here. Commissioner Plechnik. Present. Commissioner Hammercheck. Here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, we have no meeting minutes before us. Here we go. Uh, we have our first uh, public portion of our meeting, and if it's uh, the pleasure of this board, I'd like to move into our uh, clean and green. Uh, I believe that our logo contest winners we have some with us here today. So if we could uh, go right straight into that, I think that would be time well spent. David Schick. Good morning, Commissioners. So we talked a little bit last week as we had our proclamation for Clean and Green uh, Month here in Lake County. And certainly, uh, we want to welcome two students here today that were part of our logo contest uh, and acknowledge them with you here and get some photos, as well as uh, take down our last year's winner and <clears throat> certainly replace it with this year's winner. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, so certainly want to acknowledge uh, Erin uh, Panchula. Uh, she's the senior that won the uh, high school division winner. Unfortunately, she is not able to make it here today. She's doing AP testing, uh, but we certainly thank her for her submission. Uh, wish her congratulations and certainly wish her good luck on the testing that she's doing today. Uh, but I will take a break and certainly uh, welcome our other two winners that are here with their uh, up with your commission up with Welcome them up here with the commissioners <laughs> to take a photo. To uh, and uh, we'll have uh, Jessica Jajendran come on up and uh, she'll take a picture with you guys. And then we'll, uh, after she's done, we'll have uh, Julia uh, Franz, uh, our overall winner and our elementary school winner come up after that for some photos. And she'll be a part of the, uh, putting her artwork up here in the chambers here for the next year. Exceptional, thank you. Jessica, you want to join us? We're we'll, uh, more than welcome to bring your family if you so desire. So you guys are welcome as well. We'll take pictures right here. Gentlemen. I could have have the group here looking on one, two, three. I'm gonna get one more just as a safety. One, two, three. Perfect. Congratulations. Thank you. And our uh, teacher with the Ohio State Extension, Beth Bullis, is here. There's also uh, a little prize pack with some, with some items for all your creative hard work that you put in there. So thank you. Uh, we also want to uh, welcome Julia to come up, our overall winner. And certainly your family's welcome to come up as well for the photo if you would like. Well, hello. back with your family. We're actually going to bring that. Uh, we'll have one over here. So you want to set some other prizes over here. Okay. This is also yours. So then if I could have uh, the three of you over here, please, and we'll uh, replace 2020 with the 21 winner. Julia, would you mind coming up here as well?
thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. You're welcome to stay and enjoy the meeting. If you wish to uh, excuse yourselves and get on with the day, you're also welcome to do that. But thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Okay, and today we are also joined by our Board of Elections. Uh, our elections uh, officials are here to demonstrate the proposed new voting equipment uh, that we're looking at purchasing for Lake County. So if you'd like to roll it on up here, and if our IT folks might be able to pan the camera down to some of the equipment there at some point, we'll uh, get a feel for uh, what we're looking at purchasing here in Lake County. Let's not cause a workers' comp incident now. Yeah. It's only plastic. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. It bounces. I don't think we pay for it yet anyway. I, I think this is all on loan, so yeah. <laughs> so we're I, safe. I think Dale signed for it, so it's okay. <laughs> so far, the lights in the building haven't gone out when you plug it in. That's a good sign. Tell the Perry nuclear power plant to fire up a little extra juice. Yeah, it gets fired up. Some assembly required, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder if this is why elections take so long these days. Too many plugs. <laughs> Too many plugs, yes. <laughs> As long as none of them are internet plugs, right? That's one we got to watch out for. Well, we got that plug in. Oh. <laughs> Turn those machines on before all these bad puns overrun us here. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ross McDonald here, Director of the Elections Board. It's uh, an honor to be here today to demonstrate our proposal for Lake County's newest election system. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to do introductions first. So uh, again, Ross McDonald, Director. I've been Director since 2018. Uh, previous to that, I joined Lake County in 2015 as Deputy Director. Um, I have close to 10 years in, in election experience. Uh, I came previously, I was from the Delaware County Board of Elections. I worked there uh, for close to five years and uh, had a random chance meeting with Jan Claire at a conference and the rest is history and I'm happy to be here in Lake County. I'm gonna turn it over to Jan Claire. She's gonna do a quick introduction. I'm Jan Claire and I have been doing this for many, many years. It's an honor to come before the commission today to introduce the next generation of voting of which I have been part of all the generations of voting in Lake County. With me today is my chairman, Dale Fellows. Dale, you can tell him your years of experience. Uh, thank you, too. <laughs> so I've been uh, on the, a member of the Board of Elections for over 20 years, but not all consistent. Uh, I was a member of this board for a few years in between. Uh, and uh, I've also had the honor of being uh, uh, the, chi the president of the Ohio Association of Elections Officials, as Jan was at one point in time. Uh, I was also appointed uh, by uh, Secretary of State uh, Jennifer Bruner to be on the federal EAC board, uh, representing Ohio for a few years. And I was also uh, a member of and then chairman of the uh, Board of Voting Machine Examiners. So I've had a few years in a few different roles in uh, the elections world. So. All right. Thank you. 
Um, I will address the Board of Commissioners here, but certainly uh, the audience will have a chance to take some Q&A once we're done. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the evaluation process, w when we started, what we've done, and why we're here today. So um, why do we need new voting machines? Uh, the current system that we use is called the Ivertronic. It's uh, manufactured by a company called Elections Systems and Software. That's ESNS. Uh, we've had that equipment since around 2005, and it has far exceeded its useful life expectancy. That was uh, we were quoted uh, a 10-year period on those machines. Um, and we're still conducting elections on them right now. Uh, in fact, we're in the middle of a special election out in Kirtland, Leroy, and Madison School District. Um, and so the reason, though, is that we're, it's becoming very hard to find replacement parts. The fact is they don't, they don't manufacture replacement parts at this point. Uh, we're relying on graveyards of parts and pieces to get us through. Um, and at this point, we, we really need to move on. We need to implement a new system. Uh, and so we started evaluating around 2018. At the end of 2017, early 2018, and that evaluation process included uh, a mock election in 2018. I don't know if you participated in that mock election, uh, but essentially we had a, an election that was what's your favorite this and who's the all-time greatest Cleveland Indian, things like that. Uh, we had great participation. And at the, end of that or at the end of that mock election, voters were asked to uh, fill out a survey and tell us which machine did you like the most. And uh, the results of that survey were that voters really enjoyed our touchscreen interface, a system that allows them to mark a ballot on a touchscreen, but also produce a tangible paper ballot. So we have identified this newest machine. Uh, we began negotiating with them on proposals at the end of 2020. Uh, through that negotiation process, we went through about five revisions. Uh, all told, we were able to reduce the original proposal by $194,825.37. So the overall appropriation that we are seeking from the general fund is in the amount of $581,182.37. We comfortably see this as a 10-year investment, and it could go well beyond 10 years. Uh, we take very good care of our equipment, which is uh, the main reason why the Ivertronic has lasted so long. Uh, we have a warehouse manager who really looks after our equipment and, and does a fantastic job of extending the life. I want to talk briefly about cybersecurity enhancements that we have adopted at the Board of Elections since uh, around 2008. We also started that process. Uh, so I'm going to throw out some terms out there uh, that we are doing at the Board of Elections. One of them is multi-factor auth authentication or two-factor authentication. So when an employee comes to work, and that includes our seasonal employees because we that's our business model, we'll bring in a lot of seasonals during the election cycle. Before they can get on any of our computers, they must have a username, a password, and a secondary device that is on their person in order to gain access to our system. Once they're inside of the Windows login uh, to access our actual voter registration software, uh, they also have to have a multi-factor authentication. We use something that's called a token. Uh, it's a UB key that is then inserted that is th that employee's and, and only that employee's. So for example, if I tried to use Jan's UB key to log in, it would not allow that. We're doing things like device whitelisting. And device whitelisting means that if someone were to come to one of our computers and just randomly insert a thumb drive, that thumb drive will not be recognized. Those ports are disabled, um, and only they are only active when a previously whitelisted device is inserted. And we whitelist at the at the most finite level, meaning that we whitelist by the actual serial number of that device. We don't just say, okay, if it's a device made by Microsoft, allow it to work. No, we actually are specifically whitelisting for that uh, particular device. Uh, our employees go through annual cybersecurity training. That involves a phishing uh, campaign. And, and what a phishing email is, essentially, for those at home, uh, that is an email made to look like it is from someone you know and trust, and they are encouraging you to either open a file or visit a, a link that is harmful for your computer. That can take act, t basically take control over your system. So our employees are trained on an annual basis on that. We conduct background checks on every vendor, on every seasonal employee, on everyone who does work at the Board of Elections. They go through a background check. 
uh, when we engage a new vendor, they must submit what's called a uh, background check attestation that they have uh, checked their employees who are doing work with us. Um, this vendor, Election Systems and Software, uh, ESNS, they are a titan, an industry titan, and a national leader in elections. Uh, they are located in Omaha, Nebraska. All of their equipment is made right here in the United States. Um, and again, that the prospects of continuing that relationship is, is very exciting for us at the Board of Elections. We have a strong sense of comfort with this particular vendor, and we are proposing to maintain that relationship. So about the express vote. So this, this unit on my left is called the express vote. I want to de define exactly what that is. That is a ballot marking device. It, this machine does not tabulate votes. It does not store your personal information. It uh, is not connected to the internet, never is. Uh, in fact, does not have the ability to connect to the internet. Um, what it is really is a, uh, an electronic pencil to mark your ballot. The benefit of the electronic pencil or ballot marking device is that it helps voters reduce common errors that we see when marking a paper ballot. Uh, and one example would be uh, indeterminate markings, where a voter has colored in two ovals, it's a vote for one, and we cannot tell which candidate they wanted to vote for. Um, that would, in a traditional sense, go to a bipartisan team to help adjudicate that decision, and if they can't come to a decision, that would go to the board, and the board would have a, a various different options. The benefit of this electronic uh, pencil or ballot marking device is that it will not allow voters to make those sort of mistakes. It'll warn them if they're about to skip a race as well. Uh, it provides that, it really, it, it marries the benefits of an electronic voting system that we currently have right now while ushering in the benefits of a paper-based voting system. Um, the world is going hybrid, right? We've heard about crow nuts and crossover SUVs and labradoodles. I think the F-150 has a hybrid truck now that has the most torque ever and it exceeds 30 miles per gallon, right? So the world is going hybrid and we at the Board of Elections are recommending that we go to this hybrid model of an election system. It is a fully ADA compliant system. And this is critical because we know Baby boomers, baby boomers are going to become of age in that senior citizen category, and that'll be the most, uh, the largest cohort this nation has ever seen. And so we are predicting that we're going to need more assistive devices for, for folks, for our voters, in order to cast their ballot. Um, when it comes to audits and recounts, we are not recounting uh, a software report or anything like that. We would be recounting the actual tangible ballots during an audit and a, and, and a recount. Um, so it's, it's literally, we are, we are hand counting uh, against what that software report, what our certified result says. We have teams of election officials who conduct that hand count. They're tallying on tally sheets. They're, they're reporting that result to Jan and myself who have the official results and those results must match every time. And I'm proud to tell you that Lake County has always had 100% accuracy in our elections uh, when it comes to conducting those recounts and those audits. Uh, with that said, uh, Deputy Director Claire would like to speak on the topic of poll workers and, and some other items. Thank you, Director. It's nice to see you all sitting up there. It's nice to see you, especially Commissioner Young. It's great to have you back. I think one thing that, you know, Ross has talked about all the intricacies and the, the details of this equipment and, and how important it is to us as election officials to have the confidence that we need in the voting equipment that we have. It is also imperative that our voters and our poll workers have a sense of comfort. And as we looked at what they have been doing in voting process this mirrors that as Ross said it's important that the sense of comfort for our poll workers especially because they'll be transitioning into a new area I think they're going to find the the nicest part of this and this is something when we asked our poll workers what what's the most difficult thing you have to do when you're working at the polls on election day at the end of the night they said closing every Ivotronic takes a long time. That now goes away and they come to a DS200 
and they print and close that. So we go from how many? Six, 800 machines yeah. to? About in the 600s. We're reducing our footprint by around 200 devices. Right, but as far as our DS200. Yeah, these DS200 will have about 131 in the field on election day. So there you go from closing over 600, 700 machines to a much lower number and much easier. Also at the end of the night, this will print the results of the election as they've always, we've always known in, in Ohio, you have results that you can go to your precinct level, your polling place level, and you can check those results and see how many voters the same thing will continue on so it's a transparency that continues but a better ease and sense of comfort for our voters and our poll workers so we look forward to them coming on to the new generation of voting chairman you want to add anything well, jim before you move on just for those who are maybe trying to follow along we've had an opportunity to become a little familiar so the DS-200, that is the tabulator? This is called a DS-200. And its purpose is? Purpose is to record the votes in, that have taken place in the polling location. And am I using the word tabulator correctly? Yes. Okay, I, it's just I'm Precinct. trying to make sure yes. that, I mean, I'm trying to keep all the yes. terms the same because it tabulates. drives the public nuts tabulates. when we say the That's same thing with That's your voter a guide. You will have the paper ballot that comes out that you can make sure what you touched on the screen is now printed on your ballot. You will deposit your ballot into the DS-200. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. So. Okay. Thanks, Ross and Jan and, uh, and commissioners. So just to add a few things, uh, what's, what's great about this from the board standpoint is our number one priority is always election integrity, absolutely number one. And this absolutely uh, accomplishes that, without a doubt. When you have, mm -hmm. this is, does nothing more than just marks your ballot for you, but takes out the human error, as Ross mentioned, so that we don't have to try and determine how did the person's intention be, that we see it. That becomes the official record whenever there's a recount, when we're doing audits. And as Ross mentioned, every time we, we do, by law, do audits after every single election to make sure that everything is accurate. And we've always had 100% accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the tabulator, the, or the, the uh, first off, here's the ballot. The ballot's going to be marked. You, as a voter, get to see it. Get to look at it, make sure it's correct and then you put it into the tabulator, which is nothing more than just an adding machine. It's not even a calculator, it's an adding machine, literally. That's all it does, it just adds, adds the votes as they come out and it prints out the results. And so that's, uh, it's, it is a system that we as the board unanimously agree to and uh, look forward to answering any questions or any thoughts you all might have or the public might have. I'm looking forward to really yeah. getting it out into the public. Yeah, we are. Uh, and absolutely, uh, commissioners, if, if we're permitted to, we'd like to uh, qu do a quick demonstration, in I, fact. I for would, but now while, while we had Chairman Fellows up there, though, I, I don't want to lose this opportunity now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you were a little bit off microphone earlier. Oh, so I'm sorry. One of, the, one of the comforting things for this board is you've been a county commissioner. Correct. You've, you've gone through the election process. You're chairman of the Board of Elections. Right. So your experience, your vetting, you know what it's like to sit up here. Right, exactly. And that, that's, that's value. Exactly. So yeah, again, I exactly. think the audience needs exactly. to understand that you're speaking with experience. Yeah, exactly. So I don't have quite as many years in the elections world as Jan, but uh, getting close. <laughs> Careful how you say that, Dale. <laughs> getting close. But uh, I actually was she first. Was a wee one. I was first appointed to the Board of Elections in 1990, so go back a little ways, and then of course I, I was uh, was in your seat uh, uh, for a while, and um, so I do know exactly what it, uh, what you as a commissioners might want to look at and and uh, and and uh, rely on on our expertise, and so as I mentioned, if I was off off the uh, the microphone before. Uh, I've had the honor of being uh, uh, at the federal level uh, on the EAC. I was appointed by then Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner to represent the mm -hmm. uh, state of Ohio along with Randy Seskis, who was from Columbus. So we represented the state of Ohio. All 50 states were on that, on that, uh, that board. Uh, and, um, and then I was uh, appointed 
by two different Secretary of States to the Board of Voting Machine Examiners and was even president of that, which we were the group that, once the federal certification is done by the equipment, has to be federally certified first. So once the federal certifications are done, then we, uh, in Ohio, we have a Board of Voting Machine Examiners, which I was a member in and also president of at one time, at one point, and um, we would go through any equipment that wanted to be certified in the state of Ohio had to come through us. We had a very extensive matrix that they had to go through and we had to go through with them to demonstrate everything that is unique to Ohio's voting system, which there are some things, and, uh, and to make sure that it did everything that it's supposed to do. But once again, number one priority, elections integrity and accuracy, et cetera. So uh, I've had that, uh, that pleasure. And then, then I've been chairman of the board here in Lake County just for the last few years. So. so as far as the integrity goes and the certifications, Correct. if I understand it correctly, a company is certified and each individual product model is certified. Absolutely. So there's First at the federal level, then at the state level. So yes. So a company can't just introduce something that looks like something that's been certified. <laughs> no. And if it's got modifications to it, that modification would require to go back to the recertification process. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Any changes, any modifications require those types of things. And same thing in the state of Ohio. So um, uh, it's pretty extensive uh, to get to that point. I think the beauty of Ohio's elections process, there's a whole lot of things I like about Ohio's elections process. Having been on these national boards, I get to see and going to national conferences and things uh, for elections officials, I've gotten to see other states and how they operate and, and that, and, and I am 100% uh, happy with uh, and, uh, uh, and a big advocate for our elections process here in Ohio. Uh, one of the things that is great is that now at the local level, each 88 counties gets to choose out of those certified equipment what is best for them, what works best for th them administratively, and as well as uh, what's the best received by their voters. And we have 88 counties, and they're all unique counties, uh, whether it's population, demographics, whatever it might be. And so that also I like because it decentralizes the the, uh, the process in Ohio. So, so one we more level of elections integrity, I believe. Excellent. So we have our overarching state standards, which have been vetted. They're all compliant with both federal and state yes. guidance and certifications. Yep. But then it comes down to local control. Correct. Very good. Correct. I think Commissioner Young has uh, some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Ross brought up the idea that uh, with the Avatron system, replacement parts are no longer uh, readily available. Right. Uh, do we have any assurances that replacement parts will be available farther into the future for this um, ES and S system? Yeah, so by law they have to have a certain uh, cri and certain uh, amount of years. That should be the service uh, life? To yeah. The service life, but yeah. you're talking about, what, 10 years, I think. Yeah, so, absolutely. We, that's um, what happened with the Ivotronic, too. Yeah, so we are uh, we are would enter into an agreement for maintenance on, on our equipment. So we would have annual maintenance on the express vote. As a part of that agreement, they would replace anything that breaks down. Mm -hmm. um, Ten years out, we are certain that any sort of piece that would fail would be replaceable. Absolutely, um, this this particular system of voting is used uh, pretty. Uh, in a lot of counties throughout the nation, in fact. I don't know how many exactly, but I can tell you that the at the last presidential election, ESNS had the most votes cast under their type of hardware or on their hardware and system. So um, we feel very confident on the ability to replace parts uh, all the way up until year 10. There, thereafter, it's sort of like the same scenario that we're in right now. At, you know, year 12, probably still going to be able to get those parts and pieces. Once you get into year 15, it may not be the case. You, it may be something that we would have to look at a new system. But the benefit here is that this tabulator, this precinct system, can also just accept a hand-marked paper ballot as well, if we ever needed to do that. But again, I talked about the benefits of having this express vote and that it helps eliminate those problems that we see in a, a hand-marked paper ballot. 
So uh, with that said, yes, we do feel confident that we would be able to source replacement parts. So interesting, yeah, I, I'm going to do a little history too. So uh, Jan and I both remember, we, I was there when we had the lever machines. And when we replaced the lever machines, uh, Jan did some uh, research, which is very interesting, as to when, when did we buy those uh, originally, the Board of Elections, and it was 1947. <laughs> And in the minutes, it said that they had 50 years of, of, uh, of life expectancy. And it was right about then when we were replacing them with the Sequoia equipment, the full face ballot, if you all remember that. That was the next generation. And we went from that to the Ivotronics. And, and now we're recommending that we go to the next level. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate, but uh, technology, although supposedly progressing certainly doesn't last as long as uh, as it used to uh, did the uh, 581,000 investment as you called it into this equipment did that cover the maintenance for that 10-year period or that's mm -hmm. probably charged on an annual basis that's an annual. Right. what is the, what are the maintenance charges yes yeah, absolutely I can speak to that um, currently and, and, and were they incre are they increasing I'm sure they're they are not in fact they're, um, not. they're not we're, we're going to see a reduction in annual maintenance cost of around 19,000 a year we're currently paying uh, 89,000 uh, so this new and the reason why is because they charge you a license fee per tabulator so right now we have close to 850 tabulators, all of those Ivertronics. We are reducing our tabulator footprint down to about 131. And so that's where we're see, seeing a lot of savings uh, on, our, on our license fees and annual maintenance. So uh, the answer is that no, uh, that this 581 will not get us through 10 years. It'll get us through the first year on that maintenance. Uh, it, this would also uh, allow us to, we would also have a ballot stock quantity of 200,000 ballots, which will get us all the way through this first year uh, and well into 2022, if not all the way through 2022. Uh, it'll, t it'll depend on if we have more than one primary next year, which is really being talked about right now. Um, but yes, uh, we are seeing a reduction in our license and maintenance fees annually. I take it this system was designed to overcome some of the um, oh, voters' concerns about the lack of a paper ballot. Yeah, I, th I think right. that's a fair statement. I, right now... How does, how does it overcome that when, yeah. when, when the um, voter walks out of the Board of Elections? They don't walk out with a copy of their votes. It's all fed into the tabulator. Mm -hmm. So the uh, review of the paper ballot or the, the value comes between the the actual press of the button and the feeding of the paper you're the, the you are absolutely system. right commissioner uh, one thing we hear a lot about our current equipment is the fact that they like the efficiency of it it's easy to use but they don't really see where their votes are going now i will say that we have an onboard voter ver verifier verifiable paper audit trail on the ivertronic it's just buried off into the left hand side of the machine there's a window there you would see that it's recording all of your votes but a lot of times that that can be missed by voters the benefit with this proposal is that they get the benefit of marking their ballot on a screen but it's going to eject out your votes onto the paper ballot allow you to review and confirm that that is in fact who I wanted to vote for. Those are my responses for a tax levy. Once I'm satisfied, I'm gonna walk it over to the tabulator and I'm gonna put it in. And I think uh, you know, a demonstration is worth a, a million words. Uh, so why don't we go into a demonstration at this point? Is that I believe fair proposal? Into that. Thank All you, right. please. If we All could right. have our IT guy, if you could maybe Yep. Pan for our viewing audience. And commissioners, a lot, I do have the screens facing the audience and the virtual audience. Is that okay with you? The fact that I'm showing the audience and the virtual audience I and not that's necessarily fair, you? I believe. Yes, and I think Commissioner Pletcher does have a quick question or yeah. comment. Yeah. First, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to say thank you to the Chairman of the Board of Elections, Dale Fellows, as well as his director and deputy director. We're really grateful that you're here to display this new equipment. In my mind, the three most important things for election integrity are one, a paper ballot, two, not connected to the internet, and three, made in America. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this machine produces a paper ballot 
and has manually walked over from one machine to the other from the voter express to the tabulator rather than being emailed, hacked, or transmuted through some magical technological process, I want to see the piece of paper go from one machine to the next. And I think that's what we're about to see. I think, I think you will. Absolutely. I think Commissioner Plesnick just volunteered to walk it over. <laughs> All right. <laughs> may, may yeah, absolutely. Over? Please do. Um, I would say that uh, is there a lapel mic? Because I am going to need to. I can shout, but I don't know if we have a lapel mic or a. Jason, I'm Jason, you want to okay. grab that? Very good. Uh, so, uh, so Commissioner Plesnick is going, going to play voter for us today. But before so. you continue, Ross, let's get that microphone. Okay. Because the folks listening or viewing remotely can't see this or hear Very you. Good. Sorry. Yep. No problem. You, I, you just got such enthusiasm and you're on a roll there. I wouldn't want to. No, I want everybody at home to see this. You mean the part about wondering if we have batteries in the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Too expensive. No batteries. Oh, come on. What do you want for $30 million? Yeah. <laughs> Batteries not included. <laughs> Some assembly required. Well, I can uh, sort of do my best to if continue from mind. this angle. That, yeah. that would be appreciated. Um, Thank you, Ron. So we that. have John, Commissioner John Pleshnik. He's a voter in our scenario. So John would go to the usual check-in table at his assigned polling place. John would be asked to do two things. Well, three things. State his name state his address and provide ID. He's gonna be uh, checked in by the poll worker after, after they confirm his identity. Uh, he would sign his signature. That's one part of the identification process on top of producing that actual ID. From there, a barcode would be produced by a printer at the check-in table that we already own. Very good. It sounds like we have a mic. And Thank the you. mic is on the Thank way. You, Jason. There right. we go. Is that good? All right. So I, I talked about John. He would be checked in to vote uh, after being identified. A barcode would be produced. John would then be, taking, would be taken uh, to a voting machine by an election official. The election official in their possession will have one of these blank ballots and the barcode that was produced at check-in. They're going to come together, and John, we're going to do this together. So I see that you're in Willoughby Hills Precinct. DD. DD, very good. Nice to meet you, sir. So we're going to get your voting uh, started today. So the poll worker is going to insert the blank card, and I'll stay out of the way. And by the way, this booth would have another wall on the opposite side for, for privacy. We just took it down so everybody could get a better look at it. And uh, everybody at home, I hope you can see this okay. So now the, the machine is asking, okay, what precinct is John from? That is contained in this barcode. So on this machine is a barcode reader, where I'm gonna simply scan the barcode reader. And it says, okay, I see that you're from precinct three. And in today's scenario, John, you live in precinct three. So good to have you here. It would say Willoughby Hills uh, DD at, at, on, a, on election day. Uh, so we're gonna, this is one more chance for us to confirm that it's the right precinct. We're gonna say accept. And now it's loading up John's ballot. It's going to give John some instructions on how to mark that ballot. Uh, but I believe he's pretty familiar with this. So, sir, if you're ready to start voting, please press start voting. And raise your hand if you have any questions. We'll be over to help you out. And so now I'm going to basically narrate the ballot for John. So uh, John's looking at favorite dog breed. District 1, vote for 1. He has an option for a write-in. So he is going to write in a name, it looks like. And he's writing in a name uh, by the name of Beamer. Or Beamer, is that the, Beamer. Beamer is the correct name? We, Do you want to say who Beamer is, John? We, we don't talk about Beamer here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Beamer is the puppy who put the puppy in the puppy polka, and he oh. always has my vote. There you go. All right, very good. Uh, the next race he's, he's going to consider is favorite U.S. Beach. He has a choice of a write-in. Um, he has a choice of Myrtle Beach. There are a few other. I think I saw Nantucket Beach. He's writing in one. And of course, he's going to be a homer and right in Lake Erie uh, for his favorite U.S. beach, but that's a good thing. Our next election is going to be favorite way to spend free time. He can vote up to two. And John, why don't you actually pick a couple of these instead of a write in? So he's got browsing the internet, uh, cooking, exercising, watching TV. John has voted cooking and reading are his two favorite ways to spend free time. Proposition one 
Are you in favor of Election Day being a national holiday? Yes or no? Sorry to put you on the spot there. Uh, <laughs> he's going to say yes. All right. And are you in favor of Saturday voting? Yes or no? He's going to say yes. And we do actually have Saturday early voting. And we'll be here on Saturday for those in the special election district, 8 to 4 o'clock. He can preview his selection, or I'm sorry, review his selections to confirm that what he just marked is what's about to be printed on the ballot. So, John, do you <laughs> confirm what you selected is what you're seeing right now? I confirm. Very good. He's going to press print ballot. And so that ballot that I put in at the beginning of his voting session is about to be printed. Uh, he has one more option, okay? The, the nice thing is that voting machines will give you several uh, opportunities to opt out if you made a mistake. So in this case, it's saying, are you sure you want to print that ballot? John, are you sure? I am certain. All right, let's press print. And so it's saying, please wait. We can hear the machine. All right, the ballot has been ejected. John is going to review that ballot now. And now one thing that's critical is that that vote has not been counted yet. This is John's review, op this is John's review period for him to confirm that those are his, his votes. So commissioner, would you please read out what that card says? Favorite dog breed, write in Beamer. Favorite U.S. beach, write in Lake Erie. Favorite way to spend free time, cooking and reading. Proposition one, yes. Proposition two, yes. That is an accurate statement of my vote. All right. Very good. So, uh, Commissioner, uh, the last thing that you need to do is go over to the DS200 and insert your ballot. This is where the tabulation process actually will occur. Now, it'll be critical for us to lay out our polling locations so as to force voters to go buy these machines. I, I get the impression that maybe some folks might see this as a receipt. It is not your receipt. It needs to go into the tabulator. So, John? And Mr. Director, does it matter which way I put it in, right side, upside? That's a great question. No, it does not. Uh, the graphic is going to show you inserting it in a particular orientation. The machine will accept it in any orientation. So, no uh, real learning hurdle for that part of our voting process. So, it says scanning ballot, please wait. And it says, thank you for voting. It's a really quick screen. It did say, thank you for voting. I heard the ballot go down into the ballot box in, at the bottom of our container here. Uh, and so John has just conducted the voting process in our proposed new election system for Lake County. Any questions, sir? No, just want to say thank you again. I really appreciate you coming to the county commissioners so that we can all get a better appreciation for how these voting machines work. Once again, in my mind, three things are mission critical. You have to have a paper ballot, no connection to the internet, and it's got to be made in America because the votes are cast here in America. That's right. And I can proudly say that we check all three of those statements uh, with ease. All right. Uh, with that said, uh, Mr. President, uh, are there any questions from the board or from the audience today? Well, I'll just run down the usual and customary questions. Hopefully that won't run on anybody's parade. Uh, the only point where the paper orientation is critical is when it is placed into the... Into the express vote. So uh, when we do, and this is a process that's controlled by our election officials. So this is not a voter education piece, but a poll worker training. The orientation does matter when it's inserted into the express vote or the ballot marker. It does not matter when it's going into the DS-200. And it's going to be on a specific piece of paper provided by the Board of Elections on the time that the person is casting their ballot? Absolutely, yep. That, those ballots, these blank ballots, will be in possession of our election officials at all times. That is our currency. Those are guarded uh, very closely on Election Day, and that's a part of our training. And one of the, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Absolutely, that's a part, that's a key pillar of our industry is ballot accounting. Uh, so again, we do a lot of things. We're sort of like a bank. If we give our polling location 400 or 500 of these cards and say it's 500 and uh, they had 100 votes, we better be getting 400 blanks back. So we do and strict that, accounting protocols. And that would include something that was wasted or spoiled. You'd account for those as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Uh, there are uh, commissioners talking about a case where a voter has made a mistake and they need a second ballot issued. We track those um, replacement ballots, the damaged ballots or the mistaken ballots, we are tracking them 
uh, all the way down to the last penny, so to speak. And the poll workers are going to be watching the voters very closely so that somebody doesn't just take their paper, put it in their pocket, and leave thinking they've just yep. voted? Yep, that's correct. And one way we're going to try to mitigate anybody walking out with their ballot before putting it into the tabulator. We'll have signage like this. This may not be what we land on, but this is an example of helping voters understand that they need to visit the DS200 uh, prior to leaving the polling place. And if someone uses the uh, ballot marking device, then they throw hand sanitizer on and they kind of screw up their ballot, again, they would be given an opportunity to... Yeah. The state of Ohio has a uh, three chance rule. Uh, so a voter may be provided up to three uh, regular ballots, uh, and if they get to a fourth ballot, then they're actually required to vote a provisional at that point. But we never see that. We really, you know, we might see someone make a mistake one time or something, but it's very rare that a voter would need three uh, ballots issued. And I think I've beaten those horses to death. Now on the mechanical connections to the world, mm -hmm. uh, there's no cable connections, there's no wireless connections. The unit's programmed by a specific device that the Board of Elections strictly controls yep. for that particular election? Yep. We use uh, proprietary uh, USBs or flash drives uh, that are provided by the vendor. Uh, that is, it's sort of a point of contention because they're a little expensive versus the private market, but that's for good reason. Uh, they, they are encrypted. Uh, they're coming straight from the vendor, single source. Uh, so there is really not a, a lot of commercially available technology that we're employing. It's all proprietary which I see as a good thing. So we've answered the ballot marking device. It gets the ballot uploaded to it. The tabulator, its parameters are set, uh, and there's, again, a hard connection, one-time shot. Yes, sir. Same, same configuration process as the express vote. Uh, proprietary USBs or flash drives that are used to program these. Uh, we also are using our election management system, which are a couple PCs that we program and, and burn the media to create that election definition for that for that particular election. Um, we essentially, in our election management system, we set up Lake County, all of its political subdivisions, all of its districts, and then we plug and play per election which districts are active or which candidates are active or uh, the ballot language that needs to go to the ballot. That's all programmed ahead of time. Then we do strict testing. We do a lot of testing in the lead up to an election day. We do things like logic and accuracy testing. Uh, we run test decks of paper ballots where we essentially are um, creating an election uh, result that we know what should be the result. Then we tabulate the ballots and then we compare those two items to make sure that logic and accuracy is occurring for every election. We do a public test of the voting equipment that's advertised in the News Herald. Um, so th these are all the same approaches that we'll employ with the new system. And we hear talk about the health of the equipment, uh, the electronic reporting of its health. These devices are not doing that, so that potential exploits physically not in either the ballot marking device or the tabulator. No, sir. No, sir. Today, oh. you see that we rolled in two pieces Jam of microphone. Jam, I'm microphone. sorry. Today, you see that we rolled in two pieces of equipment that we were able to just plug into electricity and it's functioning. There is no internet connection on this. So that's how it'll be deployed, and that's how the voters can have confidence. And all the programming and setup that takes place in a bipartisan, highly yeah. controlled environment. Yeah, and I, you know, I think a lot of the things you're asking, um, we want to do an open house with the public. We did one our first year here in 2019. I don't know if anybody was able to attend our open house, and what we, it was station based, and what we were able to do is really explain all of our protocol. Uh, of course, 2020, we couldn't do an open house, but if things start to relax here as they are, we would love to be looking at doing an open house towards maybe September or October to really bring the public in, let them see our tabulation room. Our tabulation room is the most secure uh, room in our office. It requires a um, simultaneous uh, swiping of a Democratic and Republican election official's ID card onto a card reader before that door unlocks. There's a camera positioned on that door at all times. Um, that room, we do not have those computers hooked up to the internet. And in fact, for lack of a better term, those computers are virgins in terms of never touching the internet. They, once they're produced, they're never touching the internet. They are there solely for the purposes of programming elections. 
Very good. Uh, Commissioner Young, I believe you have something. Um, you, you got me thinking, as usual. <laughs> um, you had mentioned earlier that replacement parts is, is a big part of the equation here, why we're shifting uh, from Avertron. Uh, and that makes good sense. And your presentations have been superb. I have no question about it. Uh, and the equipment looks looks to be excellent. A real improvement over what we have currently. Um, at the same time, I'm just wondering, how do you currently get replacement parts? Do you have to, do you order them directly from the factory, so to speak? Do you have to scavenge about with other counties or? <laughs> Yeah. How does this work? For the you mean for the current machines that we're using? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So for the last three years, we've had our ears on you know to the ground to other counties who have a lot of counties have moved on and, and implemented brand new equipment at this point. So for those counties that had Ivotronics, we actually ran down to their counties and took their graveyard of Ivotronic parts. <laughs> So at, I, you know, I've never really looked into it, but I would venture to say that we have one of the largest stockpiles of old parts and pieces of Ivertronics in the nation. Uh, but a lot of those parts are not in great shape, the ones that are just sitting in the pile. So uh, the answer to your question is that we do have to go scavenging through counties who are, uh, uh, you know, destroying their old Ivertronics. Where we'll, we'll say, hey, we'll take those off your hands. So that's what we've been doing. So right now, you could say that the more counties that move beyond us, that modernize, et cetera, the better off we are. <laughs> no, I don't know that I <laughs> necessarily agree with that. But how, how long? Um, how long would you say we could function on this with, unit, or without, on the without on, a replacement? On, without a replacement, I really wouldn't want to test that button. I mean, you know, you're okay. talking about motherboard. You were really at a point where if a motherboard went down on an Ivertronic, that's going to delay our results. We can still recover the, the votes in a scenario like that, uh, but it takes a long time. You have to crack open the machine. You have to go through some very serious surgery to extract those results. So my point is, is that I don't want to find out. I don't want to find out that, oops, we won an election too far, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because it may be expensive to run uh, good elections. You should see the cost of running a bad election. <laughs> Mr. Director. Very, very good. Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, the chairman had shared with me and you had shared with me earlier, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're the last county in Ohio to currently be using the Avertronics. That, that is correct, yeah. We are the last, uh, the last county in the state of Ohio that are using the Ivertronic. Um, I believe the last county uh, prior to us, they moved over in 2019. Another key thing about this year is that we need to implement in an odd year as opposed to an, an even year, a federal cycle. Uh, the Secretary of State actually prohibits um, boards from implementing in even years. So this is the year to do it, uh, to really work out any um, issues prior to the midterms coming up in 2022. So and real quick, uh, Commissioner Young, you were uh, on, in the state legislature when uh, the state legislature set aside in their budgets monies for all the new equipment for boards of elections several years back. And so we have not done it to this point because one of the key points I don't think we mentioned is we, we also researched those who have implemented this equipment kind of let them test it out and do the test runs, not only this equipment, but other equipment to see how it functions in the different counties. And we've gotten some great feedback from some of the other counties as to uh, how well it worked. Montgomery County being the first one to start to do using Express Broad, uh, I believe four years ago, if I remember. It's, it's been a while. So, it's a, so it's, this has been tried and true and, and, and implemented in the state of Ohio numerous times in numerous counties that we're switching and some of them did switch from Ivotronics to to this because of, of the technology so we appreciate what the legislature did putting a setting aside for us alone here 2.2 million dollars of it that's why it's only 581 thousand for us uh, at the county level which is which is great so um, we appreciate that. I just wanted to mention that. So the so other thing, too, calling, just from you're a, not calling into question my previous decision, then. Well, I'm calling. I, I, I'm not electronics. questioning it. I'm thanking you. If it was 2.8, nobody would question anything. <laughs> and as a as a commission, you can thank yourself for doing that because you just <laughs> say. Well, you the, could thank me. Say you say I did. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things too is 
just that from a procedural standpoint, you always remember, and we always try and point this out to people, an election night results are unofficial. Unofficial, and there's a reason for that, a lot of reasons for that, and that is because then we can go through to get to the actual certification. We go through the whole process as again making sure that all the votes are accurate and uh, and and true before we actually certify an election. So there's a whole process that goes on post-election prior to certification several weeks later. So just a, a procedural thing I thought should be mentioned as well. Thank you. Okay, and I believe we have a gal in the audience. Uh, Ma'am, did you have a question? Hi. Yes. Uh, I need you on the microphone and I need your name and address for the record. Thank you, ma'am. Come up here. Yeah. Uh, there's the microphone at the lectern if you wish. It's, yeah, that way you can both interact and answer. Thank you, ma'am, for your understanding. Thank you. My name's Betsy Phillips. I'm from Kirtland. Um, Welcome. Thank you. I have a few questions about the voting system. Sure. And maybe probably various of you, Dale, or, or, or you can answer. Um, so indulge me a couple things. Um, are there, I, I've been trying to review the state of Ohio's requirements as far as procurement because of the investment that we're getting from the state to enable the purchase as well. Are there any differences between the scrutiny in the state of Ohio's procurement requirements. At, uh, it, for instance, does Lake County do um, reviews in addition to those procurement requirements or you have anything special that's different? We, I Since I don't see yours online, I don't see a, a Lake County procurement uh, handbook or something online, so I do see the states. I'm going to do my best to make sure that I understand your question. Are you talking sure. about like technical testing of the equipment or are you talking quite more a few about things? It, it appears that a state of Ohio has um, quite a bit of information regarding different vendors of these types of products. Yep. And so I didn't know uh, what enabled you to compare apples to apples between mm -hmm. systems. Do you have like um, checklists of things that you review that might yeah. be different than what I see? Not necessarily. I mean, we don't, I wouldn't say that we have the resources to do some of that level of testing that the state of Ohio does. We rely on the uh, State Board of um, Voting Machine Examiners to do those tests for us. What we did do, though, is that we brought a couple vendors side by side mm -hmm. and looked at them, you know, one vendor that we were interested in versus this particular vendor. And that's when we did that mock election in 2018. We actually had a separate, a secondary vendor there for voters to check out and use. Um, so we, we did that. And then we looked at the survey responses and how voters felt about that particular uh, voting machine. So we did do that testing. We also uh, have reached out to all of our colleagues throughout the state of Ohio to ask them how their experience went with this machine as well as that other competitor that we were looking at um, and at the end of the day this is the machine that we're proposing and what we've arrived to thank you um, let's see my notes here uh, you said that the machines are made in the USA are any components of those machines manufactured in China or overseas? Um, not to my knowledge. I can get an answer to that, but I do not think that they're sourcing uh, anything overseas that way. My understanding is that this is all manufactured right here in the United States. So every component within the machine, not just the assembly of the machine? I don't want to say yes for sure on that because if you, if you start to you know, pull apart even that cabinet you're standing at, there could be a component made overseas. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say definitively uh, on that, but I can certainly uh, get your contact information and, and answer that to you definitively, okay. what I know. Well, one of the criticisms I, I think we're seeing out of the audit process in Michigan was that when they examined machines up there, and I do not know what vendor, they found internal modems that that vendor had not revealed existed to the counties purchasing that equipment. So mm -hmm. I didn't know if you've looked at the machines at internally at that level of scrutiny to see since it's coming up as an issue in Michigan. 
Well, I don't, again, I only see things in Lake County, Ohio. So okay. any references to other states or even other counties for that matter, I, I can't speak to that. Uh, what I would say though is that again, that State Board of Voting Machine Examiners, they have the resources and the funding to really dive in. You know, from my understanding, they're, they're pulling these apart. They're looking mm -hmm. at the insides of them. Yeah. And so because of Ohio's strict law on no wireless uh, you know, voting or communication of voter data, we prohibit that in this state. Um, I don't think they would pass muster on that board if that was the case in Ohio. And Dale Fellows, being a yeah. former board member, could speak. Yes. So um, all the uh, technical folks within the Secretary of State's office and within the state, they are the ones that actually, before it even comes to the Board of Voting Machine Examiners, makes sure of all those those types of tech, whether that would be uh, in there or not, as well as the F as the uh, the federal uh, certification level. That's well, well because all that data. I mean, I remember we would get like this thick of all the data from those testings and all the things that would would be in there uh, that was done at the federal level as well as the state level before it even came to us. So it would never never get to that point here. I don't know what Michigan, what, ha what they have in Michigan, if they have a similar system, but I know our system wouldn't allow it. Now, I wasn't on the, just so to clarify, uh, Claire, I was not on the board at the time this got certified, just so you know. <laughs> so, it was a while back. And um, la lastly, um, one of the criticisms of this particular vendor in a recent review by the Secretary of State in Texas was that the, there was a practice where um, they talk about, uh, it's, a, it, it's called a hash testing. Are you familiar with hash testing? I'm not. This is a, um, it's, a it's a flaw in the installation process where there's a verification when the software is installed into the system, into the Express Vote touchscreen system, where it's impossible to know if the software installed matches the version that was certified by the Federal uh, Elections Assistance Commission. Uh, and the the issue that the Texas review came up with was that they were hoping that the local elections board would be able to do this hash testing to determine if the software they thought they bought was what was installed in the local machines. And the flaw that Texas revealed was the vendor did this testing and so the criticism was um, this practice was described as buying a new home and before closing the seller says you don't need a final walkthrough mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that was the one criticism that it was like the fox in the hen house if the vendor was doing the hash testing review of the software versus the local board of elections and so that now. that would be the uh, last my last question that and i'll let you go ahead so um, when we onboard any kind of new election equipment we do what's called acceptance testing and as a part of that acceptance testing we are looking at things like which firmware version that it's operating on mm -hmm. to ensure that that is the firmware version that that was certified by the good, state of ohio good, so it took me a minute to kind of see where yeah. you were heading in your uh, discussion yeah. but Absolutely, we're doing acceptance testing day one. Uh, whenever we, if we're lucky enough, fortunate enough to have this implementing in the in, in Lake County. Great, yeah. great. Jan, did you want Thank to mention? You. Yeah. And, Thank you. And Betsy, I think something too that we need to recognize is when the original software that was certified on the iVotronic was the software that was downloaded onto our system, and that was the last time at that initial. Uh, implementation that the vendor has ever touched the software. There have been upgrades to software versions throughout that last 15 years that we did not, yeah. we did not implement. And anytime, if there is any kind of 
uh, update that will occur, that vendor first has to go through the federal testing for certification, come into the state of Ohio, present to the Board of Voting Machine Examiners, and then get certified at the state level before they could even come into our county. So the, I, I know you have good questions, and I know what we read out there about what happens in other states and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Ross and I are very clear that when we come before you and we talk about anything regarding elections, we're talking about the state of Ohio and Lake County in particular. And Lake County has always gone, as you know, because you've been around a long time, we go beyond what is required statutorily when we conduct elections for all the checks and balances. So um, we look forward to anyone who does have questions to come in. I'll be leaving July 30th, and you can set up an appointment with Ross, or you can call Dale. <laughs> We're also available prior to July 30th. <laughs> Great. It's good to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Nice I had a question. I had a Betsy. Commissioner Bet Young has a question. For Betsy? Yes. Oh, Betsy, I think you have a commission. Not a question, really. Betsy, could you send uh, a copy of that Texas report uh, to Jason? Sure. It was a pretty simple, and it was probably a simple question for someone who has better t high tech skills than I do. I probably stated it in a much more complicated way than it, it probably could have been, but actually, no, thank I, you for entertaining that. It was a good question, and, and I think, I hopefully, with my response about the acceptance testing that we'll yeah. do, I hope that addresses any yeah, concern. Yeah, I think the level of confidence is that you do it locally yeah. instead of having where their criticism was that the vendor was doing it, so they were reviewing their own product. You, right, and we wouldn't, you it doesn't make do sense that. to do that. We're, it's a, it sh we should be auditing what they tell us, Thank and that's you. what we always, that's our default feeling on everything when it so, comes to the vendor. So in Lake County, we do the final walkthrough. With the that, realtor, and yeah. that, that's yeah. what he's indicating. So right. that that's that gives me some confidence. I still Thanks. would like to see that report though from the Texas Secretary of State. Okay, I'll, I'll get your email. Well, I'll just send yeah. it to Jason, and he'll send it to all of us. I'm sure. On the board. And I just have one comment. I think uh, I think uh, what Ross has said, and in, in, in a very simplistic form, we trust but verify. That's right. And I believe I saw a hand in the back of the room there. Uh, Mayor Morley, did you wish to? Uh, uh, yeah, no, you need to come up here. You may be the mayor of East Lake, but you got to get your steps in. I show you preference, and no, uh, what am I going to? Gee, Willikers. You know, I, I have a reputation of being hardest on the people I care the most about, so quick get up there. question for come Ross on. and the group. Thank you. Uh, for the mayors and managers, Dennis Morley, mayor of the city of East Lake, mayors and managers president. Quick question for the mayors and managers. Uh, is this equipment going to be in your office, and if so, can I set up a meeting with the mayors and managers to come in uh, to take a look? Yeah, at absolutely. We uh, will have this demonstration equipment for as long as we need to. Okay. So would love to set up something with the city managers and mayors. That absolutely. I appreciate the time that you guys have taken uh, to get us up to a new century of voting. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor. Thank you, Thank you, you Mayor. sir. And thank you for being a good sport there. And did I see another hand? Uh, Mr. Massey. This is part of the Hammer Check Wellness Program. It perhaps. is. Everybody's <laughs> going to get there. And he's wearing his tennis shoes, so there uh, you go. Yeah, Brian Massey, uh, Concord Township. Uh, Ross uh, pretty much answered my question, but I I'd like a little more clarification. You said that there's no wireless uh, connections allowed in the state of Ohio. So how do, how do, when you go through the tabulating machines and you've got multiple machines, you've got to accumulate all the data, yeah. how, does the, how does the data get from the Lake County to the state? Great question. So uh, once we get our results back to the headquarters here in Painesville, uh, we have a standalone computer that's operated by the Secretary of State's office. It's actually their property. Um, they send us single-use thumb drives that we, we, are, we have a requirement that we have to upload to the SOS every 15 minutes. And so we will uh, essentially export a results file from our EMS system into that single-use thumb drive. It's a one-time use only. I walk that over to the SOS computer. They have an upload system. That's a program. It's basically a, it's an intranet, by the way, that we're not we're connected directly from Lake County to Columbus on the system, and we're uploading it that way. Uh, so 
that to me that's not tabulation though that's more reporting results mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to counting votes okay. I appreciate it and uh, I agree with uh, Mayor Morley we appreciate the transparency by the Board of Elections thank you very much thank you sir indeed and uh, just for those who may be wondering SOS Secretary of State yes and Secretary of State election management system. Uh, yeah I apologize I, I got a little quick on my glossary term so if I said EMS that's the election management system not to be confused with first responders and then SOS is uh, our Secretary of State who is the chief election official for the state of Ohio um, so glossary terms very important yeah that, that's okay youthful exuberance mr. president <laughs> sir I also have a question about the SOS is it or is it not true that the Secretary of State in 2019 named Chairman Dale Fellows the election official of the year? That is, uh, that's what I've heard. We'll let him answer that question. Chairman Fellows? Uh, yes, that's true. But, uh, and I know that uh, it was very humbling, that's for sure. And uh, it was, I know that uh, the folks at the Board of Elections here nominated me. So, a, thank you. In a bipartisan manner, he was nominated and chosen by the staff, the board members, and we were really excited to see Dale stand up there and receive the honor. It was great. It was a surprise. Fantastic. No, that, that good news is a definitely a good thing. Very well. Ross, is there anything else that you feel would be a benefit for this board or those who are uh, viewing this meeting? No, I, I would just say those at home or even in the audience, uh, if you want to set something up or you want to you know, do a mock election just like Commissioner Pleshnik did, uh, I have some ballots available. Uh, we would ask that you go ahead and reserve that time because we are busy right now. Uh, we're conducting a special election. I do want to plug that for our voters at home. Indeed. If you are in this special election, it's very important that you participate in this election. So again, that's Madison school district Kirtland school district and Leroy Township we're here for you this weekend we'll be open for early voting if you'd like to get it done and then on Tuesday May 4th your polling place will be open from 6 30 a.m. until 7 30 p.m. and for those who are wondering about the physical uh, access to this building we have a sheriff's deputy manning the front door and after hours we have a representative for Board of Elections allowing people into the building for purpose of voting that is correct Commissioner Okay, just want to get that little plug in there because when people say the building's closed, no, it's not. Yep. It is, but it isn't. <laughs> it's you. there for the required activities. So, uh, Dan Dale, anything you want to add to this discussion? Um, and I, I think Ross touched on this, but if in fact uh, the equipment does get uh, approved by the commissioners, and that our intent is to get out into the community everywhere we can. That we're allowed to under protocols and things to get folks used to the equipment and have them demonstrate it like the at the county fair and things like that we're going to be at to make sure that everybody gets a chance to check it out before they actually go in and vote on it the first time in november so and we, always be we always encourage folks to sign up to become a poll worker for us i think you get a very good front row seat of how we do things when you become a, a poll worker and i'm seeing a few poll workers in the room uh, Mr. Massey being one of them. Uh, so he knows very well uh, how we do things. And with this, if we're lucky enough to get this new equipment, we're going to need Lake County's best and brightest to help us get it implemented. This is a community thing, everybody. This is a community thing. These are your elections. And we want to just help you uh, see the best system that we can provide for our voters. Thank you. And while we've got you, I'll give you one little departure from the, the discussion. The paper ballots for absentee balloting or early paper balloting, there's no plan on changing that. It's going to be just like we're all used to. This that's is the only new element coming into the system. That's correct. Yep. Uh, absentee voting by mail would look the same for those voters. And early voting, we'd still have the same procedures, except they would use the new system to do that. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Did you want to take down your gear now or get it after the meeting? What's it's up to you. If you want us just to come back and get it later so you can proceed, it, we can do that. We're, we're running a little long. Yeah, so I if figured. If you don't mind, I, yep. I'm, I'm sure a viewing audience is saying, well, you just made a first record there on public comments. So while you're here, though, Jason Boyd, I didn't even look back to you. Do we have any electronic submissions of public comments on this subject? 
We do not. Jason Boyd County Administrator indicating none. I just wanted to make sure we gave our viewing audience an opportunity as well. So with that, I thank you very thank much. Thank you. You're more than welcome to stay and watch the meeting, or you can beat feet. I'm getting lots of waves and bye-byes, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your time today, folks. Okay, and with that, Jason Boyd, do we have any? Well, let me start. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to address this board on other matters? Indication of none. Oh, I got a, I got a sign. There you go. Come on up, Mr. Lima. Please, if you give your name and uh, address for the record, please. Thank you, sir. I couldn't see you from behind the thing. Yeah, you for, right. Thank you for right. waving. Um, you were in the mic is on, I think. Um, yeah, um, and I understand because of the uh, late hour that the commissioners are uh, serving lunch today. Is that correct? <laughs> it's under your seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave it's a Lima. Light meal. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Lima, 7774 Litchfield Drive in Mentor. A uh, conversation about the possibility of the construction of a new jail piqued my interest and the interest of other uh, Lake County residents, including uh, Commissioner Young. The $100 million construction cost certainly added to that interest. Um, I sent uh, all of you an article published by the Vera Institute that presented arguments for and against uh, such construction. I hope each of you have had a chance to uh, review it. The 76 page document, I believe yes, it was. Yes, the 76 page document with. Just so our viewing audience has a sense of scale. 47, <laughs> <It's a small laughs> <book. laughs> 47 pages of, of uh, written uh, work with uh, the rest uh, references. Thank you, sir. Uh, without going into detail, because of the length of that article, the main thrust of the paper was to question the uh, advisability of costly new construction when we are in era of falling crime rates. The paper suggested that other alternatives to incarceration should be explored. The paper also explores the role of our criminal justice policies and practices and suggests changes that could impact incarceration rates. The cooperation and collaboration between this commission, the community members who would bear the cost of such an endeavor, our prosecutors and our courts and our law enforcement agencies who largely control the levels of incarceration would be critical in ensuring an outcome that would be benefic beneficial uh, to all Lake County residents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Okay, uh, anyone else in the audience wishing to address the board? Okay, Jason Boyd, County Administrator. Do we have any electronic submissions of questions for the board? And that appears to be a yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, especially to Commissioner Young. It's great to see you. Uh, we did receive an electronic submission this morning um, from Adaria Morgendorfer. I will enter this into the record for the commissioner's consideration. <clears throat> Questions for the Board of Lake County Commissioner. Please feel free to answer individually or collectively. Commissioner Hammercheck, regarding the comprehensive building study for the current jail that was referenced at the April 22nd, 2021 meeting, can you please confirm that this is the same comprehensive building study that the Board of Commissioners were discussing at previous meetings over a year and a half ago? Commissioner Young, at the April 22nd, 2021 commissioner meeting, you called for a comprehensive building study to be performed on the current jail. Did you forget that a comprehensive building study had been completed, had been commissioned and completed, or did you as vice president of the commissioners with Jerry Serino as president of the commissioners waste tax time and taxpayer dollars on a study today you consider to be of no value? Next paragraph. The board, the board appears to to be trying to inform the public that there is a need for a facility improvement at the current jail or a complete replacement. Are these discussions a part of an ongoing process? And if so, can you please give an outline of what process it is that is being followed? If the, if the board proceeds with the facility improvement at the current jail or a complete replacement, given the county's current revenues, <clears throat> where is the funding for the project going to come from? 
Commissioner Hammercheck has already indicated <clears throat> that at least he has no appetite, excuse me, that he, begin quote, has no appetite for a new tax levy, end quote, and Commissioner Young appears to have no interest in any increased funding. End of public comment. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I'll endeavor to answer what I can. Uh, in reference to the first question, uh, is this the, the yes, the, the, the comprehensive review, the answer is yes. Uh, in regards to uh, trying to keep the public informed, yes, this is the proper venue for having uh, discussions and deliberations and uh, presumably ultimately decisions. In fact, taking no action is also a decision. I'm looking over to legal, so if I say anything that's improper, please correct me. Uh, we are endeavoring to exhaustively be open, transparent, uh, whatever the word of the day is, but these discussions need to be had and we are working closely with our sheriff. We are working closely with our entire justice system. So you know, the, yes, this is all part of an ongoing process. Uh, trying to give an outline, um, shooting from the hip would be risky. So anything that I say here, well, I know it's not Ron calling this time at least. Uh, John, could you, uh, Clear that call, please. I'm sorry. Well, that was one way to do it. <laughs> so, so when President Biden calls back to tell us he was bringing us funding for this new facility, <laughs> um, okay, all humorous. Um, I'm, I, I will take a swing at uh, describing the process that is uh, ongoing, but in no way do I wish to represent it as being comprehensive or exhaustive. What I'm about to say. So, if I leave something out or get something out of order, please don't endeavor to do a slideshow club me about the head and face like a baby seal. Oh. Um, so with that, uh, discussions from my perspective began when I took office uh, in 2017. Uh, I was presented with a uh, review and a study that predated my time as commissioner. I worked closely with uh, Sheriff Dunlap and uh, closely with uh, now Sheriff Liam Bruno, then Chief Deputy Liam Bruno, who also was the administrator of the jail in his time and also served as a corrections officer in that facility. The discussions centered on reviewing the mechanicals, the electrical, the plumbing, uh, the actual programming of space, the needs and the demands of our current population, as well as uh, becoming familiar uh, with the standards and requirements that are uh, imposed upon us by the Ohio Department of Corrections. I, I believe that's the agency having jurisdiction. Uh, there has been a number of discussions regarding funding. There's been a number of discussions about uh, preserving the facility that we have. Much of that uh, took place in a I'm going to say a binary way, one of necessary maintenance, and while things were being examined for necessary maintenance, a detailed study of the infrastructure. Just as an example, the exterior of the building, uh, there was clear signs of separation uh, from the main structure of the building. Uh, the potential for catastrophic failure of the outer skin of the building was very real. Uh, while we were examining it for uh, structural integrity, that was also the time to be making repairs to do every reasonable thing to keep the skin of the building from falling off, uh, which would have dire consequences. Uh, those discussions led us to uh, looking at what are the alternatives, everything from talking with the state uh, to what can we do for a refit of the building? What can we look at in terms of new construction? What can we look at for uh, an addition for its purpose built with uh, a refit of the existing building? Every reasonable option had been exhaustively looked into. We then went back and had outside expert professionals uh, review the building and give us a number of recommendations and alternatives. Uh, we focused only on viable alternatives, not fanciful ones. Um, we have been looking at what the ongoing needs are. Again, the state of Ohio has made a number of overtures regarding, uh, I'm going to call it jail funding, but along with those discussions, it wasn't so very long ago, maybe up to 
two years ago now, we were put on notice that there was a possibility of having fifth degree felons returned back to the county jails. That number would have very likely overwhelmed our capacity overnight. Those same discussions are starting to bubble to the top yet again. So the public needs to be aware that there are circumstances beyond the control of this board which are going to be forcing decisions that we have no control over our local courts who have been tremendous partners as part of our justice system also have no control over that it would be the state taking this action and we would have to it's a i believe the phrase unfunded mandate would be appropriate to ascribe to that um, so where we're at now is we've had plenty of time to uh, i'll use the term soak on the last review just kind of take a look at it, begin to appreciate it, to follow up on uh, where the state is at and what they will offer. Uh, there was requests to give proposals. Lake County was right there, Johnny on the spot, because we have taken this so seriously and it went nowhere. Uh, from, the county, from Lake County's perspective, in general, it did find its way into the capital budget in the form of $50 million, uh, which is broken up into two $25 million uh, I believe the word tranche is appropriate to say uh, because it's a biannual budget. Lake County very likely, although we have requested consideration for some of that money, will not qualify because the, uh, the criteria for review seems to be rewarding bad behavior. Lake County has done, I'm going to say in recent years, a tremendous effort of trying to maintain the building. It's kind of like an old car. You take care of what you've got. But again, I'm going to continue to give high praise to our corrections officers uh, for maintaining the standards of the requirements imposed upon that facility to our administrators and to our sheriff for maintaining the uh, required uh, standards be met. So uh, again, you're, you're seeing a process which now we are more openly discussing this because this and I'm going to say personally, I like to talk about what the big number is. What is the, you know, what what, what in a perfect world would a a new properly configured facility look like? And then we can start talking about how are we going to pay for it. We're we're in that discussion phase. This is again part of a uh, uh, a good service to uh, community. And if my colleagues want to jump in on any of these, please feel free. We are looking at everything from uh, onboarding engineering experts to assist the county and what kind of delivery methods we're going to be using and I believe the last one was the uh, project funding well I think I sort of started alluding to that we are examining all possible funding sources be it federal be it state uh, be it local uh, just today for those who may not have seen the uh, investment board uh, Commissioner Young had a I'm going to say insightful uh, suggestion about as the county is investing dollars although they're pooled right now we have no statutory authority but uh, if we're investing those dollars elsewhere why couldn't we invest it back into the county it, it made sense it's something that obviously we'd have to look for legislative authority we'd have to uh, manage those dollars and I, I would imagine there'd have to be some consent and partnership with our county treasurer a lot of mechanics associated with that it's beyond the scope of this discussion again if I could just emphasize this is not intended to be comprehensive or exhaustive in nature even though some of you are probably wanting to claw your eyes out right now uh, with that I'm going to uh, turn this to my colleagues if you want to address anything if not we'll uh, move on yeah I, I'd like to address a few things uh, number one uh, to Mr. Hackman, um, are you aware that there's the county has no, we have no legislative authority to use any of those monies that the treasurer is working with under any conditions? Well, like I said, Commissioner, I'd, I'd have to okay. research that issue. So you're and not more, sure at this more, point? No, I'm not sure. Okay. More All importantly, right. I'd, I'd defer to bond counsel so for the, the county. So the legislative authority may be there. It's possible. Um, I believe we, we can we can hope it's it's worth looking into yeah, it's, it's yeah so we'll look into and that. if not it um, would be a bad thing to ask our legislators to see if we could do something responsible again as I said during not, the meeting I don't yeah. want to see another coin gate that could be bad if it's not available then certainly we could take the next step and that's that's a great idea as well um, 
I'd like to see a thorough investigation done into the need for the costs of the long-term expectations we're looking for in a new meet, in a new a new jail facility. And what I mean by that is simply that in open public debate. Uh, where we bring in totally unbiased experts. And by totally unbiased, I'm talking about people who have had no previous experience working with the county and have no expectations of working with the county on any type of infrastructure improvements, uh, building, you know, whatever. Simply experts, much like uh, Mr. Lima was describing in the, uh, was it Vera? The Vera Institute. Yes. Vera Institute. Um, well, we could just have, we, they would speak, we would ask questions. It would help us arrive, I think, at some sort of a viable uh, decision. It's such an important decision. The largest investment of this type the county has ever made and we're doing it at a time when the federal government is spending money hand over fist, and we're probably looking at tax increases already on a number of our citizens. This would be an additional tax increase. Now, I know it doesn't require a vote of the people. This is something we could do internally. But at the same time, any time a deliberative body like this uh, meets one day and makes a decision and the next day, based on that decision, people pay more in taxes. I consider that a tax increase. Uh, and already, locally, people are suffering. I, know I won't go into great detail, but they're already suffering. Many people are, in fact, are looking at losing their homes now or having to sell because of property taxes. Um, and I think we all realize that when taxes go up, generally productivity goes down. Why? Because there just isn't as much money available in the private sector for investments. Um, so this is a critical decision. And it's one that I don't think we should, be, we should make based on either internal sources of information or on sources of information that could have a biased perspective because they have a history of working with and an expectation of working with the county into the future. Um, so I don't think we're there yet. I think we need more time to deliberate. Uh, I like the, the work Commissioner Hammercheck has done on this. I, I would say it's been extensive and um, in detail, and I really respect it, and it's certainly information we need to look at uh, very seriously. But at the same time, we're not there yet, in my mind. So I don't wanna be the commissioner here. Uh, actually, check we have. I'm trying to think, I've, I've got the sheriff in the audience, and I really would like to, uh, reach out to our sheriff. Um, I believe, to Commissioner Young's point, I believe we brought in subject matter experts. I know often you talk about bringing the experts. We brought in the experts who are professionals in masonry, who are professionals in the electrical systems, who are professionals in plumbing, who are professionals in structural integrity. I can't imagine the bias of is this toilet plugged or not deciding do you get the plunger out and I, I don't mean to say this with absurdity there literally are challenges right down to the commode level and I'm not trying to make light of this I, I'm being very sincere when I say there are issues with what is it that's plugging in that toilet is the same thing that goes into the holding tank because there's no grinder before we can pass it on out into the municipal uh, sanitary sewer collection system, so we therefore have to be pumping this at a great deal of cost to the county. 
the grease separator. So again, as it, though it may sound like I'm making light of this talking at the commode level, by the time it hits the street for processing, that alone is that's that's part of the the, the mechanicals. Uh, there's no bias to that. Uh, our sheriff, when you know who started out as a corrections officer and who intimately knew where the shutoff valves were. Uh, there were, when, when you talk about unbiased, I, my experience with that is when I used to work for the county, pulling cable through that new building to get it commissioned, there were collapsed conduits. People who had no attachment to the county, that's what we had. And we had a number of deficiencies, the oversight was for all practical purposes there in name only. Uh, again, I'm not trying to be critical of our predecessors, but we had a contractor that had no ties, uh, <laughs> literally no ties in the uh, corrections universe. Uh, they built a very traditional building. I, I believe at the last meeting I referred to it that day, the day that building was commissioned, it was already obsolete. Uh, the programming of the access control systems. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. If I remember right, I think even our sheriff, uh, as a corrections officer, had to learn the system and program it himself. I can tell you the <coughs> control systems. I believe they were a PLC4 or a PLC6 on some touchscreen pads. They were legacy systems the day they were commissioned. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable, and I, I realize that it sounds good to bring in people who have no attachment, but those people also have no interest in protecting the vital interests of the people of Lake County. Uh, Sheriff, if I'm saying anything that's not accurate, please correct me, but have I hit on the key points? I Could I respond? Oh, please, sir, please. This, um, this is the time for this discussion. I just, I, I just want to define what I mean by unbiased. Um, I've just found over the years that um, Folks generally do what's in their own self-interest. That's just the, that's, I found that to be, unfortunately I found that to be human nature. And that's what cap makes capitalism work. People are motivated by doing things that are in their self-interest. That's just the way we're wired. And now I'm a Christian and I will Indeed. admit that uh, Jesus Christ doesn't operate that way. <laughs> but that's not who I am. I mean, I, I try to, but I don't always uh, reach that, that point. So when I say unbiased, I mean folks that uh, don't derive any level of income or have any expectation of increasing whatever level of income they currently derive from county activities of any sort. Uh, I'm talking about experts in the field of uh, jail, jail construction, um, or at least public building construction. So I'm interested in this Vera Institute, uh, not necessarily because apparently they have a, a uh, they, their perspective seems to mirror mine in some, in some areas, otherwise they what they're cautioning is that uh, we take a very close look at all these different uh, aspects, the cost, the long-term needs, et cetera. Um, I I'd love to hear from the sheriff. In fact, I need to tour, I need sheriff, to tour the building could. yet. And I've been derelict in that because of course I've had some situations intervene. But, um, <clears throat> At the same time, the sheriff is very close to the issue. And um, while I trust him, at the same time, <laughs> you're very close to the issue. So I don't want to try to uh, say what you're going to say for you. I'll get out of the way here and. Uh, let you go ahead and say your piece. Go right ahead, sir. Sheriff, right, please. On the sheriff. Um, before I offended by your comments, to tell you the truth. Sir, is your, sure microphone, on, sir, is your microphone on? Is it great? I'm offended by the comments that I am biased and self-interested 
in this effort to build a new jail facility. Did I say that? Yes, you, you did. did. I don't think I did. You can run the tape back. I'm elected because I think the people of Lake County have confidence in me as the Lake County Sheriff looking out for their interest in what's going on in our county regarding the criminal justice system. I have been intimately involved in the Lake County Jail since I started my career. We have done two studies, 2015 study ordered by the Lake County Commissioners, which found the jail is end of life in terms of its mechanical structures and is no longer able to support an expanding jail population. They estimated that the cost to remodel that facility would be approximately $18.5 million. The 2019 study that was ordered by you and the commissioners at the time in 2019 found the same to be true two independent studies as well as an exterior study done on the building by the Lake County Commissioner's Office that found structural in problems throughout the facility. We have studied a jail remodel that would cost approximately 20 to 25 million dollars to remodel that jail facility to current standards. That remodel, if done, would provide a jail facility of 353 beds. We average 365 Lake County inmates a day. When the jail opened in 1990, it housed 100 Lake County court inmates a day a 353-bed facility. The commissioners at that time did rent bed space, 60 to the Marshall, 60 to uh, Cuyahoga County, and that brought in approximately $3.5 million a year in revenue that offset the cost of that construction. So the $20 million it cost to build that facility plus the $10 million in interest, the $30 million on that building was paid for over the next 20 years in part by jail revenue that brought in about $40 million into the general fund of Lake County. Part of that money was to use to offset the cost of officers to manage that population and food, but also to offset the cost of construction. We have, we have detailed that we are out of space. I know Mr. Lima brings up the Vera study. Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, it's not a study I'm not aware of. I've read it numerous times. The Edna, Edna McConnell Clark Foundation in the Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation are left-leaning foundations. In the very study, says from the very beginning, our study is intended to show we should be out of the jail business. Some of the areas that they bring up, Lake County has been on top of for years. Their main pitch is to move minimum security low-level offenders out of the justice system. I agree. The Lake County courts agree. We have been doing that since that facility opened. In fact, the Lake County jail that used to be two-thirds misdemeanors and one-third felons has now switched its population. Today, we have two-thirds felons, one-third misdemeanors, all most of those misdemeanors are waiting for trial. 
or serving local sentences. The Lake County Court, when we looked at this study, the Ed McConnell Clark Foundation says, don't rely and, and build jails to rent bed space. I think Mr. Hammercheck can, can attest to this. I have always said Lake County should never depend on rented jail beds. It's not the way to pay for a jail. It's not the purpose for a jail to be built. However, under the current administration, under the current administration of President Joe Biden, the marshals have been ordered, marshals have no beds except in cities where they have major federal facilities. Locally, they have to rent beds. Locally in Northeast Ohio, the United States Marshals need to rent 800 beds. They've been ordered them to move them out of private facilities. I agree, I don't believe we should be housing inmates in private facilities in a nation where the punishment of our offenders should be the role of government, not private industry, to make money. I agree, I've said that for 20 years. Because of that, the marshals are currently looking to house 800 inmates in local jails. There's no beds available. If we were to build another facility to expand because our population is expanding, renting those bed space would be an opportunity to offset some of those costs, but that's not the reason to build this jail facility. Our offenders, if you study our population, because nationally it is that uh, minorities are being unfairly punished into the justice system and housed that way. When you look at Lake County, our probation departments are very active. We keep as many offenders out of jail through our justice system. I can't say enough about Lake County courts. The offenders that are ending up there are fourth and fifth time probation violators. At some point, there's no other place to house them. The other point regarding that is there is this issue about releasing people without bond. I see the problems that it creates in New York City where they're releasing dangerous inmates back into the community. And those inmates are not only reoffending, they're killing people. I don't believe that's safe for our residents, nor do our Lake County courts. Our Lake County courts already go the extra mile to make sure if people can make bond, they find a way to do that, unless they're a threat to society or they're habitual offenders who don't reappear in our court system. We have over 1,100 active warrants, the majority of people who have failed to show up for hearings, and that's what we have to work on. So when you say we need an expert, what does an expert make? Is it because they're out of state somewhere? They live 200 miles away? Is that what an expert is? I have over 30 years experience, not only in the correctional field, but managing it. I have gone to Europe to speak to the European Union on jail reform. So I am very upset. When you say I am biased in that I'm not a professional nor an expert in this field because I am. Well, number one, I've, I've never said you're, you're not an expert and I've never said that uh, you are biased specifically. I never used that term in reference to you. Um, However, at the same time, a couple of important components you left out of your presentation is that people are losing their beds already in Lake County because property taxes are too high. So I don't want to increase property taxes. I don't want to see businesses suffer because they can't afford to do business here anymore. This is, these are serious issues. 
And for you to stand up here and tell me that, oh, we've taken care of all of this. This is, this is a done deal. We've got some reports here from 2015 and 2019, and that's a settled issue, and I'm an expert, and I've traveled the world. Uh, I don't question any of that. And I get the impression you know what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing. And that's critically important for a sheriff. And I respect that. But at the same time, for you to stand up there and say, we don't need any more studies. Now that's a waste of time. Why bring in an expert? Why bring in two experts, in fact? One that's pro, one that's con. Let them have a discussion. Let the commissioners, and maybe even and bring you into the equation as well, ask questions. Maybe we could all learn something. It's possible. Although, you seem to know a great deal. And I respect that body of knowledge. And I respect your position. And it's an important component in our decision. I'm not setting it aside in any way. So, um, what I'm saying is that further study is necessary. A hundred million dollars for a county the size of Lake. That is a great deal of money, Sheriff. And anytime you talk about taking money out of the people's pockets, it's, it's a critically important issue. Critically important. People are hurt. Now at the same time, building a jail is, is a necessity. You know, as you said, under state law, we need to have a reasonably functional facility there that does the job we need done. And we need you to give us direction. You're giving it right now. But at the same time, I'd like to see more direction. And when I say unbiased, what I'm talking about are people that don't have a monetary relationship or the expectation of a monetary long-term relationship with the county. Sir, that was the exact study we did a while ago that we've been reviewing and our actions have been based upon. Uh, for those viewing, what you're witnessing is this is the venue where discussions, deliberations, and this is where we can try to persuade each other to a different way of thinking. So if you see the passion, you see the energy, this is, this is what government is about. It's not about coming out here and everybody voting in uh, a unanimous fashion without any explanation of how we arrived at that. So these are matters that are subject to discussion and fair debate. So I just want to get that in there because candidly in government, you don't see very often uh, honesty uh, to Commissioner Young's points. I, I believe there is a segment of society that you truly represent. Um, but I, I, I have to say, we have a ministerial function that requires us to provide buildings and budgets. The jail is a building. The budget maintains it. We have a budget that needs to be solvent. And I believe there is to be completely honest with those uh, witnessing this discussion, I cannot envision a way where we can save our way out of this, meaning by cutting this or leveraging that. There's going to need to be some creative things. Again, your suggestion about the investments, I, it's kind of growing on me, actually. It, it sounds like if there is some statutory authority, that'd be an interesting area to look. But we still need to be able to pay that back, and our auditor will not allow us to move any monies around uh, by certifying funds until we show a mechanism whereby we can actually do that. Um, to the sheriff's point and the discussion and the uh, information that Mr. Lima, who I believe, yes, I will recognize you here shortly, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little taken aback to hear that your philosophies and theirs line up. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Um, I think their ultimate goal is no incarcerations of any kind. So I'm pretty sure that the justice system is not going to be thrown out, with, you know, baby with the bathwater. Um, I cannot think of a single person that has worked on that jail that is going to say, ooh, shiny, let's build new, I'm going to make a boatload of money off of this. 
in fact, many of the discussions that we have is let's find out what our needs are and then, and I know this term is so abused, but I believe I'm using it correctly, value engineer a true cost, which means somebody is going to lose money, but the people are going to save money. Uh, we're not talking about a pittance here either. We're talking about millions of dollars. Yes, there are people in trouble. We have many programs right here in Lake County, rental assistance. We have people, some people who are just too proud to go. I don't know what to do to help them if they're just too proud to go. And I, I will freely admit this, in my family, you'd have never seen my father or my grandfathers, either on my mother's side or my father's side, ever accepting public assistance. That's just the world they grew up in, and I'm sure we're of that ilk. But there is assistance available. Um, one of the things that I advocate, and I know you're strong on this issue of economic growth, grow the pie. We have federal dollars that are going to be coming our way. Unfortunately, the, the monies that have already been offered, and I hope you can sense my frustration, we've not been given guidance as to how we're allowed to even spend those dollars. So that, that is something that the uh, legislature has yet to do. Uh, I believe Lake County is in line for 44.6 million. And right now, I don't honestly know what we're even allowed to. Jason, have they even given this guide? Jason Boyd, kind of administrator, indicating that it ha that guidance has not yet been forthcoming. No, there's a call today at one thirty. Call today at one thirty. Yeah, just regarding the topic, I don't know what the agenda. Gotcha, is. and I can tell you with absolute certainty, the County Commissioners Association has taken this matter up. Literally, we're dealing with little more than uh, discussions rather than hard guidance. Uh, again, I appreciate your patience. Um, this is an environment that rarely people avail themselves of. Um, I can say with absolute certainty, uh, Sheriff Dunlap gave me a tremendous amount of latitude, but he also knew me back when I was just a green kid, fresh out of college. Uh, it, I'm sure it frustrated the daylights out of him. I think we can all agree that Sheriff Dunlap was a very proud man and very procedural. I stayed in due bounds as I did my due diligence as a county commissioner. Uh, Sheriff Liam Bruno, during that time chief deputy, gave full access to every aspect of that facility. And what were the proposals? What were the programmatic needs? Uh, all of this has been readily available and I, I thank you for acknowledging that yes I have made an exhaustive effort yes I have tried to learn as much so that I can be the best servant to the needs of our community and be respectful of the limitations of our community uh, I've been working closely with Jason Boyd and our sheriff in regards to working with uh, the County Commissioner Association and the uh, legislature as far as getting things recognized Lake County was one of the driving forces that got that pittance of 50 million, which I can't believe I'm saying 50 million is a pittance, but again, compared to the needs in the state of Ohio, uh, it's frustrating. And then having to go through the exercise of asking for something that we have no reasonable expectation, but I can assure you our application is one of the best. Unfortunately, we just don't qualify because although we are physically the smallest county in the state of Ohio, we are the 11th most populous and we are the seventh wealthiest. That is all being held against us because we have capacity. And those are the things that we need to deal with the reality that there are demands on this board and on our community that we have little or no control over. And we really need to hold our legislators responsible. We need to get them engaged, our professional associations, uh, getting them engaged. There are communities that are being rewarded for basically doing nothing. If you want to consider neglect nothing, I, I consider doing nothing something. And you know, I, I, I regret my passion discussion on this, but I, I think those questions that you've raised have been asked and they have been answered and we have matured to a point where we need to stop spending money on report that reviews a report that reviews a report. It's time that we actually do something. We're not the Army of the Potomac. We need to make the hard decisions. There's a reason why we're sitting here and we need to take this very seriously. And if we need to tell the people, I'm sorry, you have stage four cancer, you need to tell them you got stage four cancer. 
If you say congratulations, you're just one citizen of the year. Tell them congratulations, you're one citizen of the year. I'm trying to give a few analogies here, but doggone it, we've, we've got to stop concealing indecision with report after report after report, because who do we find that's unbiased? Based on that criteria, where do we find these people? I don't know. And I'm not about to do a nationwide uh, search to find people that would meet that criteria or, or, or prohibit somebody who might give us the perfect solution of oh, which you're prohibited from being able to participate in carrying that out. Great. How that serves the public interest is beyond me. Uh, I think I've vented enough and I, I'm seeing some twitching here coming from my right. Commissioner Plechnik. Mr. President, I'd like to start by saying that <coughs> Everyone on both sides of this dais has prayed for a long time that there would be three people sitting here, and I just want to start my comments by saying I'm very grateful that those prayers are answered and that Commissioner Ron Young is sitting here with us because it has taken a lot for him to come back here. It's taken a lot of prayer and a lot of personal sacrifice, and Mr. Young, I just want to say I'm honored to be sitting here with you. Uh, but I want to continue by saying that as a city councilman for some years in Willoughby Hills, when I had to make the decision of how to spend taxpayer dollars, which I've always said, and I do mean, are ours and have to be spent with the understanding that this is our money and we have to respect it the same way we, res we would respect our own kitchen table household budget. Because Lake County is not so big that we can pretend that this is funny money. We don't print we don't print money like the federal government does. These are hard tax dollars. These are sacrifices from businesses, from residents, from neighbors, and I've always appreciated that. But when I had to make a decision about my police department, I looked to my police chief. And I had confidence in my police chief because I had a role in choosing him. As a councilman, I voted for him or not. And as a Lake County resident, I vote for my sheriff or not. We have a role in choosing our sheriff, just like we have a role in choosing our police and our fire chiefs, and we choose the people that we're confident in. So if we're doing our job right, we're picking a sheriff that we do trust. Uh, I, I think I'm a little more pessimistic than uh, my colleague, Commissioner Young. I don't think there is such a thing as an unbiased person. I think that everyone comes to the table uh, with biases, concerns, and considerations, uh, but when I look at when I look at an institution like uh, the Vera Institute, I eyes wide open see this is a left of center organization. They do have a political agenda. They were founded by a man who donated one percent of his income to the United Nations, uh, who wanted to outlaw squirt guns because he was very opposed to Second Amendment rights and gun ownership. And those are positions that some of our residents share. But those are positions. Those are biases. And so that's where this is coming from. Uh, I do think there's some valuable insight, bias or no, that we need to limit incarceration to worst offenders who really do represent a public threat. I think that's a valuable insight, whether it's a bias source or not. And it's one that I think Lake County wholeheartedly embraces. We've just heard our sheriff say that this has been the work of decades. Our prosecutor's office under Chuck Colson, our judges uh, currently under presiding judge, if I'm correct, Pat Condon, uh, have partnered together to make sure, have partnered together to make sure that only the worst offenders are in our jail, which is why two thirds of those offenders are felons and all of them present some public concern that is sufficient to merit the cost of incarceration. Emphasis on the word cost. This is not something anyone celebrates. This is a last resort that is very expensive to each and every one of us as Lake County residents. But it is an expense that we have to maintain. Uh, I want to express my bias. I do trust our sheriff, frankly, and Bruno. And I do support our sheriffs. I do support our law enforcement. I do support our police, especially when it's unpopular to do so. Last year, when I saw the calls for defunding the police, I asked, where is every pro-police rally that I can find in the Tri-County area? Because I want to be there holding a sign. I support our police. Not because they're free. Not because they're there without sacrifice. Our police officers sacrifice the most to be there. And it is a major investment on the part of society. 
to train and prepare those individuals to provide the facilities so that they can make sure that our community is safe. But that's exactly what they do and Sheriff Lee and Bruno is on the front line of that. Just as a councilman looks to his police chief as your Lake County Commissioner, I want you to know that the first source I'll look to is our sheriff and our police departments and making choices about our sheriff and police departments. And there is no one I trust more on the subject of whether we need a new jail than the man who ran the Lake County Jail for countless years. And I know that he comes to us reluctantly when he says that the jail that he served a majority of his career in needs to be updated, needs to be replaced. It's not my job or any commissioner's job to put themselves in the place of the expert and substitute. I am never going to know as much about law enforcement or the jail as our police chief, Chris Collins, who now works for our sheriff's office, and our sheriff, frankly, and Bruno. I will never know as much about law enforcement as a member of law enforcement. Where my difficult responsibility comes in and where the Board of Commissioners has real responsibility is to decide how we pay for it. And that is going to require a public conversation because I agree with Commissioner Young. Raising taxes at a time when residents have been asked to sacrifice so much with the shutdowns, with the job loss, with the economy, that is a hard pill to swallow. But we also need to remember that cutting the budget and looking to each department that has critical needs, like our clerk of courts, our county recorder, isn't easy either. And borrowing money has consequences. Guess what? You've got to pay it back. Our folks in D.C. don't always seem to remember that, but eventually you either pay the money back or you're bankrupt. None of these options are easy. And I know that our president, I know that Commissioner Young and I are going to work very hard to find a way to do our job, which is to pay for what Lake County needs. And I want to say right here on the record, Sheriff Liam Bruno says that we need a new justice center, a new jail, then we need a new jail. I agree. That's his job, to come to us and tell us what law enforcement needs. It's our job to find out how responsibly we pay for it in a way that's legal. And I know that our county prosecutor will always be there, along with Dave Hackman, to make sure that we stay on the narrow road but also what's in the best interest of Lake County. And I am humbly open to hearing any thoughts, concerns, suggestions on how you think the fairest and best way to pay for a new jail facility. I prefer to say Justice Center because I agree with Mr. Lima that ultimately the goal should be rehabilitation and safety, not incarceration. Incarceration is a sad side effect of bad decisions and societal problems. It's not a goal. No one's goal is to put people in jail. I know that Sheriff Liam Bruno would love to save us a lot of money by kicking everyone out of our taxpayer-funded free rent facility. It's not our goal to incarcerate people. It is a last resort when safety demands it. And what's demanded of us as county commissioners is to provide that last resort facility in the fairest, most fiscally responsible way possible. And as somebody who spent six years as your councilman in Willoughby Hills, who balanced the budget, who cut taxes twice, who cut the city debt in half. There is no one who is more serious about fiscal responsibility than I am, than Commissioner Young, than President Hammercheck. And it's going to be a debate because we don't do what some councils, boards, and commissions may be doing. I suspect they do, which is to privately have conversations and to make decisions in the shadows. And then everybody comes and they look like they're friends because they go, yes, 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 I agree, I agree, I agree, because the difficult decision was hashed out privately out of the sunshine. No, no, no. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. And the public deserves to hear this as difficult as the conversation is. But I want you to know that I support Sheriff Lee and Bruno, I support the police, and I support you. And I will be working hard with our commissioners to find the best way to pay for the safest facility possible as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Young, I believe you have something to answer. Yeah, I just want to clarify a couple things real quickly. Uh, number one, I am not a primary supporter of, or even a supporter of the Vera Institute. Um, 
glad you got that on the record. I, Thank I was, you. I was simply saying that uh, we need to bring in subject matter experts that have no involvement. Now, I'm not sure exactly how we qualify that or define that. As Commissioner Hammercheck had mentioned, that he wasn't sure exactly what that meant, and that's something we might have to hash out. Number two, um, we certainly need to listen to our experts, uh, our primary experts. And of course, our sheriff is a primary expert in this area. Uh, but that doesn't mean that every time one of them walks in and says, I need an additional five million because this is an absolute necessary project. And doggone it, you guys need to provide me with the funding to build that. That doesn't mean that we need to provide them with that funding. It's our call. We have to make that call. And it's a hard call. Sometimes against people we respect, we like, and uh, who are indeed experts. But sometimes we have to do things in the public interest that don't necessarily match their interest. Um, and I think this has gone on for a long time, and we're not going to settle this today. It's, it's but, a healthy debate, and it's completely but, uh, appropriate. I th but, uh, and, and I wasn't aware of the various institute uh, leaders' uh, position on squirt guns. Yeah. So the founder. <laughs> so I'm, that, that is an interesting uh, observation. So at any rate, uh, that's it. Ready to move on here. And, and I think... We have some, someone in the audience who'd like to I say something. Do, your, call, I, your call, Mr. Uh, President. Sure, uh, although before we move on, J Jason Boyd, County Administrator, of the people who were involved in that second review, the that reviewed the electrical, the plumbing, mm -hmm. the mechanical, I am not aware of any of them having any monetary interests in giving us any misleading or biased uh, if I could just ask you to comment, I am not aware of anyone. I, I believe the last study met the definitions that uh, I believe Commissioner Young has articulated. I, I, I don't know what more we could have done. Is there anything that I'm missing or not understanding? Have you been following this? And if God bless you if you have. Um, yeah, I don't believe there was any, any bias to answer your question. Um, I think we tried to take, I guess, on behalf of you know, management and the staff, tried to t tried to bring in, or we did bring in uh, experts in construction, experts in plumbing and HVAC to kind of give us a. I wouldn't say what should we do, but a physical. Here's what's the matter with your legs. Here's what's the matter with your brain, and let us make or let the commissioners decide and make the form decisions on which type of treatment we may or may not want to take. It would be my very simplistic approach. Um, the study in 2012, 2013 was, was commissioned right before I came in. Um, similar results, I guess, of the two reports, um, and I think they were done by the same outfit. There is some consistencies in those reports, which I think is a good thing. You know, that you know, it's it's been time and time again confirming what I've heard from some of your supervisors that work in the building. What I've heard from two sheriffs now. There's been consistency throughout. Um, and I, th I think uh, my job as your administrator, Mike Matus's job, is when you guys make the decision in which path we go down, we will figure out a very fair, and equitable uh, finance mechanism to achieve that goal. And, and we're, we're willing and able to do that when the time is right. And if I could just continue to put you on the spot, uh, the definitions between the first study, the second study, the second study was more of a deep dive more rather the first study was more superficial hey let's give it first blush the second one we were actually at removing parts of the exterior structure we were dealing with are the bones good i think that was a one of our themes are the mm -hmm. bones of the building good mm -hmm. that's true uh, so if i'm saying anything again that's not accurate the report when it came to us and i, I believe you were at the meeting i challenged that report uh, color coding post-it notes I'm old school I print things off what can I say I saw it you did we we had a vigorous deep discussion to validate the information that was being given to us it was not being given to us and blindly saying yep we got to do this or yep we got to do that I, I think it's fair to say that 
is as far as the current facility goes it has been examined studied and life projected and better memorialized than probably any facility of its type in the state of Ohio. I, I know the state has been really impressed with our submissions of documentation and the detail. Is that a reasonable statement? Yeah, I, one, one of you gentlemen said earlier, we've almost been penalized for doing a, a good job trying to keep the, the ship afloat. And I think another important point as, as the board considers along with the sheriff is the physical plan is one thing. Capacity and long-term operations is another thing because we can invest a lot of dollars in a current facility, but that doesn't address our long-term occupancy um, or, or bed count, if you will. Just another observation. So, Fair enough. Fair enough. Jason, thank you. Is there anything else for Jason? Yeah, I, I, I had a thank you, question or two. Um, so um, you said it was the same outfit that did both studies. Uh, why is that? Was, do we have a long-term relationship with uh, the organization who did the study? Does I, the county I, I, have any kind of relationship with them? I can't speak to the first study, as I said, the second study. Um, well, it was done by the same organization. Correct, as far as the long-term relationship. Um, uh, K2M uh, did the, 20, I think it's 2019 study, Commissioner. Um, one of the reasons I recall that we selected them is just in their experience in public safety and jails and corrections. Um, I have not had any other experience with them. Um, they did successively receive, um, they did some design work on the buildings and grounds building uh, over on Jackson Street, which uh, was a very successful partnership. Um, but we have no other pending contracts, relationships uh, with K2M, or, or quite fr frankly, zero firms on the jail project right now. It's just, you know, purely discussion. And so, so the folks that did this study had done work for the county? Correct. They des did the design work on the buildings and grounds, telecommunications okay. structure that was, was completed in 2017, 2018. Were they, paid, were they paid for their work on the study? Correct. Okay. And what were they paid? Do you recall offhand or? Um, I will look that up for you. My gut tells me it was a ninety thousand dollars, but I will get you that exact information on the twenty nineteen study. Okay. And it, and I know they also included um, <clears throat> conversations not only with the sheriff's staff but the courts and sentencing patterns and the whole kind of shoot and match. It was a pretty in depth dive. So, but I'll get you that information. And why were they chosen to do? Have they done studies in the past similar to this? In Lake County. Anywhere. Well, they, <clears throat> I think it was under a former ownership in 2012, 2013, a different structure. They, they, they did some work here for in 2013 for former Sheriff Dunlap. Um, and yes, they've done some work um, in Cuyahoga County. And quite frankly, when we were on the phone with DRC, Department of Corrections, just spitballing numbers and grant applications, they said, have you guys talked to anyone in the past? And I said, matter of fact, in 2019, uh, we used a firm called K2M. They said all those, uh, that, that firm, knows their stuff when it comes to corrections and construction in the state of Ohio. The studies that they do, are they related to potential future work? Otherwise, if a county wants to, to build a facility, uh, K2M might offer uh, to do a study on why the facility uh, would be worthwhile, uh, or wouldn't be worthwhile, perhaps, um, in the hope, obviously, of of uh, getting a little chip in there, if you will, as to you know winning a future bid. Well, I mean, um, the, the procurement process is spelled out in the revised code. Yeah. Um, so when we, as we did with this building, uh, there would be a statement of qualifications process that the K2M or whomever could submit that will be reviewed and scored collectively by the board. Uh, so I can't speak to what their or any outfit or any firms. Uh, priorities are or business practices but in this particular project we will have to per revise code do a public procurement process mm -hmm. not only for the guys you know putting the drawings together but also the gentlemen who are going to be swinging hammers so there's gonna be two procurement processes public processes to bring those entities on our team when that decision is made okay very good I hope that answers your question. I'd like to add, too, that you've really done exceptional work for the county throughout the years you've been here. So, well, Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate you. Commissioner Hammerchick, is it? Uh, 
well, I'm going to get yelled about this. If I do it, I'm going to get yelled at it if I don't do it. So, Ron, you approved this study. Yeah, I did. You allocated the money. The questions were asked and answered. I'm glad I did. And now for you to be coming back and circling back, I am totally confused as to how you could commission a study to answer these questions and now question the study that you yourself authorized almost two years later. I'm, 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 well, I'm, I apologize for my frustration, but good golly. Commissioner, we've moved on. We've moved on. Now we're talking about a hundred million dollars. We knew that the day that no, thing hit, and I sat in that meeting, and that architect and engineer and I it. went at it pretty good. I questioned every that was single some time page. Ago that, and things have changed. We are on the verge now of making this decision, and uh, the fact we had one study done in 2019 doesn't satisfy me at this point. Even though I was a party to that, I would have been a party to a second study as well. I think and the I word sophistry not. comes to my mind. I cannot believe what I'm hearing, Ron. I, that I cannot believe what I'm hearing. Ron. That you, that you think that because I approved a study in 2019. You didn't even acknowledge that, its existence. I can't let this pass. That I can't let this pass. You didn't even know it existed. And now you're making a what stand mean, on this. I didn't even know it existed. When I we was were, there when we passed. When we talked. Then can you share with me what is the estimated cost? Can you give me some details? Can you refer back to it? I know you've been given it a second time. Ron, I, I haven't I, been given it a second time. I'm, I'm looking getting, I'm right at it. it. I'm yeah, looking right at it. I just right received it. it today. Jason, was this emailed to the commissioner? No, I, Commissioner Lee. I gave him hard copies due to the volume of that, so we put it um, Thank you. anticipating maybe he would be here last week and I was in his inbox for this week fair enough okay. I, I'm, I'm just concerned to be hearing a, a, and, and the reason I'm emphasizing this k2m is recognized by the state of Ohio so anything that they give us <coughs> will rank and being a legislator you know this far better than I it comes down to ranking recognition of authority we're, it's, it goes along the lines of our discussion we had about election equipment. You, John, you, you go just, with recognized vendors. I'm, I'm John, it's just one source of information. And it is a source that we have a previous relationship with, a source that has profited from its relationship with Lake County. Um, to me, that's a negative factor. Now, was it enough to overrule my fellow commissioners in 2019 and say no this study isn't necessary that I think that would have been irresponsible of me but and maybe I should have brought these points out in a stronger way in 2019 I'll certainly give fair, that. fair enough fair enough um, but I don't think that negates what I'm calling for now and that's simply what question what what is in that study that has not been asked and answered that's the part that i'm we, we are at the point where we need to start making decisions we are in probably the worst time in the history you know from an economic perspective we've got so many things to weigh and balance and i am not going to waste another 100 or 200 thousand dollars on a redundant study to tell us what we already know so well and Sheriff, if I'm saying anything that's not true, as I always like to say, please, sir, correct me. And Jason, could you please move so I can lay eyes on the Sheriff? Thank you. Sheriff, am I saying anything that's not correct? The sheriff is shaking his head no. I, Ron, I, 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 I am not prepared to invest another one hundred or $200,000 looking for, and, 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 the, and, the, and the suggestion that we bring somebody in that's going to tell us Oh, you don't need a jail. Just give everybody a parking pass and send them home and smack them on the back of the hand and wave your finger and say, don't ever do that again. That's the other extreme. Well, I don't know how you get somebody who comes in and tells you you don't need a facility. You don't need to make improvements. You don't need to adhere to the Ohio Department of Corrections standards of which we are mandated, mandated, unfunded mandated. And that's the other part that's sticking in my craw, by the way. Uh, I, I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. Again, I am not a... prepared to invest $100 million into a project based upon 
the recommendation of the leader in that subject area in Lake County, regardless of how trustworthy he is, and he's very trustworthy. But again, he works in that area every day, and uh, he'd like to improve it. He'd like to see it functioning uh, in a world-class way, in every way. I'm confident of that. And that's one of the reasons why I'd support his reelection anytime. But at the same time, this is not a call he, he has to make. This is a call we have to make, I believe. And we have one subject matter expert, uh, K2M, that again, reputable, et cetera, but one. And you put that on, this, on the pro side of a $100 million investment, and for me, that's not enough. We're not looking, you have to, I think it's important, and I, I believe you are, but I think we need, I'm emphasizing the side of the equation that's pointed at folks, perhaps in the lower income brackets in Lake County, that are already barely able to carry the load of our current property tax levels. Barely able to carry that load. And um, to put a further burden on them at this point, in my mind, uh, requires even more effort on our part than we've put into it so far. So, and, and you've carried the heaviest burden as far as effort put into it. Fair, fair enough, thank I, you. I believe that, I know that to be the case. So, um, you hear you've worked your butt off trying to get everything together possible and you've got this guy who's been, you know, on the sidelines for the last year or so uh, telling you how to run this process. And uh, I apologize for that. No, no, no and again, no apology. But, so this um, is a matter subject to fair debate and this is the venue in which this kind of discussion needs to take place. I, I have to keep throwing that commercial on. I love it when I see the attorney nod. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you. So, um, my, I, I, I leave it at that. And, and I, not, not to try to set a world record here for public portion discussions with such a few, some limited audience. Um, and I assure you I'm not being sadistic by having you bopping around the corner of that machine. So um, I, I'm just concerned that we're, we're, we're making this a discussion about the funding mechanism not the need. We, we haven't even gotten to that part of, okay, how do we afford this? We, we need to have the discussion about what are the needs? What, what is the lots of lockdown this price? You know, we've got a number of things because this, this is a, a multi-year process and we're a couple of years into this process. So even if we said go today, they're not going to be breaking ground tomorrow. There's a, a great deal of uh, diligence and planning and, and projections that need to go into this. And again, Sheriff, if I say something incorrect, please correct me. This process needs to progress. We can't go back and say, well, we're going to take the last couple of years. Yeah, we're going to scrap that. that. That's not acceptable. And, and if you compare and contrast the first study to the second study, the second study, as we demanded, you and Commissioner Serino were, were spot on with you know demanding more detail. I was emphasizing more detail. We got more detail. We had people digging into that building. Again, what, what are the bones good? I know that might sound a little cliche or awkward, but is it a salvageable building? Could it be <clears throat> enhanced to meet our current needs and our future needs? Those types of discussions were all part of that. And give us options. Give us options. And there's nothing in there that says, hi, K2M is going to be your only option. I, again, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm certainly not trying to be a cheerleader for K2M. I am going to be a cheerleader for Sheriff Liam Bruna because I do recognize him as a subject matter expert. And if he ever decided he wanted to do consulting, I'm pretty sure he would be nationally recognized because his pedigree associated with the time he spent in that facility and his continuing education and certifications and accreditations are impeccable and they have value and anywhere else in the state people would be welcoming him in to give this type of input and he's salary we're getting it all for one price 
So with that, Mr. Lima, I appreciate your patience and thank you for sparking this very spirited conversation. Please, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. And it is good to see you smiling. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, there we go. Um, well, I'd like to interject just a little bit of levity, uh, if I might. Uh, the definition please. of a consultant, uh, someone who takes the watch off your wrist and then tells you the time <laughs> and gets paid for it. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Um, Welcome back. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, uh, I, I want to make it clear that I, I'm not disputing any of the facts and um, conclusions that have been reached uh, by the studies, uh, by our sheriff, uh, who certainly um, uh, expressed uh, information and data that I think is valid. Um, we are in our jails. Uh, suffering largely from overcrowding. If we did not have overcrowding, there would not be a cry for additional space. And then the question becomes whether that additional space uh, needs to be new construction or whether that, uh, whether renovation might, uh, might uh, provide uh, for the needs. Um, but uh, so those are questions uh, that certainly uh, are relevant, but overcrowding is the main driver of uh, uh, jail populations. That, whether it comes from the Vera Institute or from another uh, organization, I think there is agreement that overcrowding is, um, is what, uh, what we're faced with. The issue is more systemic than it is with the facts of this particular facility. Um, we need, in my view, a change in the policies and practices of the criminal justice system. And another little quip is if we don't change our direction, we're liable to end up where we're going. And where we're going is continued overcrowding, whether it's a new facility with additional beds. What we know is that if the system doesn't change, then the overcrowding persists. And um, I, would, I would just, I, I en endorse the idea of further discussion on this, investigation, not, ne not necessarily um, um, uh, uh, a, a new uh, study, a new $100,000 study, but for the community to be involved in this, to have a seat at the table, and not just through our elected officials, but from individuals who are impacted by this, and we're talking about individuals who have violated the law, and who uh, have firsthand knowledge of some of the things that I don't think any of us have. Um, and so, uh, having a a larger uh, community input about this sort of thing, because it is a hundred million dollars uh, 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 projected, um, and to determine policy, that is what we're all about. It's not up to the sheriff, it's not up to chiefs of police to determine policy. It is up to us, the community, to determine policy, our policing policies and our criminal justice policies. It is up to the chief, the chiefs of police and the sheriffs to implement those policies. And so, I would argue um, that uh, uh, whatever kinds of discussion uh, are to ensue, that the community uh, uh, be granted seats at that discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. And if I could just quickly, mm -hmm. emphasis on quickly, uh, you, you made this comment about uh, you know, overcrowding being the main driver. 
in our example though here in Lake County we are talking about a facility that is end of service life so although overcrowding is a real concern we have an old facility that is challenged and being able to meet the ongoing needs of our community I, I just want to get that point in there you, you mentioned systemic issues I really want to point out and I, again I'm very proud to say Lake County is leading the way our own Judge Lucci his court will be a pilot site for the, uh, mm -hmm. let's see, Ohio Supreme Courts. There's a uh, program for sentencing criteria where it's a unified system. Judge Lucci is going to be a representative. We are honored that our courts have been recognized as being uh, an appropriate thank you because it's so easy, much easier to just lay eyes. Uh, he just moved aside from the equipment that was blocking us. Mm -hmm. And I also feel compelled to mention that Judge O'Donnell, I believe, was actually on the steering board that established the criteria for this unified system of which Judge Lucci will be participating in its implementation. It's a great deal of burden uh, that our courts have taken upon themselves. But again, it shows that these issues are in fact being taken seriously. Our criminal justice system in Lake County is one of the leaders and we do make concerted efforts to be responsible. And I do appreciate your sharing your thoughts and your ideas. And now that I think we have set a world record for uh, meetings and Jason has actually moved to the other side of the room, do we have any other uh, public comments for this portion of our meeting? We have 67 public comments. <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah, zero public comments. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. The, 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 the shock was our comedian, uh, Jason Boyd, said we have 67 public comments of which I'm sure the look on my face was priceless at that moment, so you got me. <coughs> okay. Mr. President. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is not a joke, although it's painful and funny at the same time. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Mr. Lima because you're right. The public needs a seat at the table. And frankly, this is the public's table. And this is where the conversation has to happen because this is where the decision is made. We can set up a committee or a nonprofit and many important committees and nonprofits exist, but they're not here where the decision is made. So I'm really grateful that you're here sharing your opinion, and I would encourage members of the public who are listening in cyberspace, who are reading the News Herald, you know, please add your voices here, because this is where they're going to be heard most directly and where you'll have the most direct say. Uh, second, I think it's very important to understand the role of the county commission. We've talked about the home rule of cities and municipalities versus our role here. Uh, there is a policy function, and the community ultimately should be the policy maker. A government that doesn't hear the community is not a representative government, in my view, is no government at all. It's just a tyrannical dictatorship. So I agree the community should be the ultimate public policy making body. But our little role in that as the county commission is to implement state law. We exercise no power or function beyond what the Ohio Revised Code gives us. The policy that the county commissioners are implementing really is the policy of the state legislature. So your state reps and state senators say, by Ohio law, you must have a jail, and it must be built to these standards. We don't get to second guess that. We don't get to say, we don't need as much security for a jail or a jail isn't necessary at all. Those decisions are made at the state level. So as the community knows where to direct its attention and its comments, I'm certainly interested in that debate and I'm willing to engage in it, but I don't have the voter the say there. Your state reps and your state senators do. And then lastly, I wanna say this, because we are so fiscally responsible, we do plan so carefully for the future, and I say this, in great compliment of President Hammercheck and Commissioner Young, that we're really looking at worst case scenarios. When we say $100 million, believe you me, our goal will be to come under that number. But we're trying to pick a number, maybe a little bit on the high side, so that we are giving a realistic estimate. Given that, materials prices have been through the roof. Have you gone to Home Depot? Have you tried to buy a two by four? It's a lot more expensive right now. We're hopeful that some of those costs will come down, but they may or may not. So $100 million, I think, is a fair estimate, a little bit on the high side, but it will be our responsibility to try to get that number down. But on the topic of 
under promising and over delivering I just like to close on this to take mr. Lima's example let's let's bring a smile at the end I had the experience of working with then chief deputy frankly and Bruno as a councilman for the city of Willoughby here Hills years ago and he said John you need to be on county dispatch you can save money for your residents and we can improve response time so that when someone calls 911 they will get there faster they will have a more precise location as to where the call is made and we can save lives. Well, it's certainly true. As I heard from my police chief, my fire chief, the firefighters, the individual officers, they were able to respond faster and increase safety in our community so that when you needed to make that unthinkable call, you had an immediate response. But my recollection, we were told we could save about 150,000 a year. I think our first year we saved about 300,000. Those are very rough numbers, but we ended up saving roughly twice as much as then Chief Deputy Frankly and Bruno and Captain Mike Warner proposed to us because that's the kind of professionals they are. They're going to give you the worst case scenario and then they're going to double their efforts to come in even stronger, which is why I believe that with their help we will be able to build the jail for the best possible price. I hope it's less than 100 billion. And we're not even talking about the revenue that can be derived from having extra beds. But right now our jail is almost at full capacity, but with those 10 or 15 extra beds that cycle through, we are renting out to the federal marshals. And we're putting those tax dollars back into the sheriff's department, back for safety. And I believe that with the careful administration of the sheriff's department that we'll be able to achieve a lot of savings along the way. It would be irresponsible for us to count on that, but I know the leadership of Frankly and Bruno. I've seen it at a lower level. I see it now at a higher level, and I'm confident that working together, we're going to do this job for the residents of Lake County. We're going to do what Frankly and Bruno always does, which is to under-promise and over-deliver. And I'm committed to that, and I know that our president I know that Commissioner Young are committed to that too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Young, anything further? No, no. That's fine. I'm hesitant to ask this. Is there anything anybody else would like to add to this conversation? Thank the good Lord. Okay, moving on to resolutions. Madam Clerk, if you're still awake, uh, <laughs> resolutions. I'm up. I'm here. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay. In resolutions, in the engineer's office, resolution authorizing advertising for bids for the Lake County Engineers Road Department SALT 2021 LCE project number 2021-004, bid opening May 19, 2021. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. In the utilities office, resolution approving plan specifications and estimates of cost in the amount of $3,119,883 for Adams Court Industrial Park and Melridge Pump Station Improvements, project number 415S, and advertising for bids for the same bid opening June 2nd, 2021. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. Randy, would you like to give us a little background on that, please? Sure, these are three lift station, uh, sewage pump stations that are out in our system. They're between 50 and 60 years old and they're beyond their useful life. And so um, we have pri prioritized these to be replaced this year. Very good, any further discussion? Thank you, Randy. Madam Clerk, roll call please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. Resolution increasing appropriations and transferring cash within Lake County Department of Utilities Water Operating Fund and Project Fund 595, Mansell Road Waterline Replacement Project 407W. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion, Randy, again, a little bit of background. I think we're just setting up these accounts at this point, right? Exactly, yeah, this was the project I reported on last week that we uh, opened bids on and to transfer money in order to enter into a contract with the, uh, with the best bid. Very good, any further discussion? None being heard, Madam Clerk, roll call please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. In Job and Family Services Department, resolution approving the Lake County Department of Job and Family Services, vouchers, date of warrant, May 7, 2021, in the amount of $94,875.57. Move to adopt. 
Oh, second. second. Mm. Okay, it's been regularly moved and seconded. Discussion? None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Plechnik? Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck? Yes. In the Commissioner's Office, resolution to adopt the revised Lake County Flood Damage Reduction Regulations for the unincorporated areas of Lake County, Ohio, for participation in the National Flood Insurance Program. Move to adopt. Second. And discussion. Jason, have we received any further comments or anything? Because this is one we had the two public hearings on. And I believe our county engineer had to excuse himself because of other duties. He had to involved. go to bed. He had to go to bed. <laughs> 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 um, yes, commissioners, thank you. Um, yeah, this is the final step in the process to uh, stay in conformance with the um, National Flood Insurance Program that's co-administered by the county engineer and our Lake County building official, Dave Strichko. Um, I am looking at the clerk. I do not believe we received any public comments. We did not. Throughout the past three weeks. So we are ready to go. Um, this packet, uh, meeting notices, transcripts will be uh, compiled today by the clerk and assistant clerk, sent to Mr. Landig, who will thereby send it to the ODNR and FEMA for final uh, compliance checks and adoption uh, by May 5th, which is next week. So the timing worked out quite well. And thank you for conducting the public hearings in the past three weeks. Indeed. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Very good. Thank you, Jason. All right, with that, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. In the Finance Department, resolution approving payment of bills as listed on the Commissioner's Approval Journal in the amount of $1,752,124.78. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. Resolution approving purchase orders as listed on the Commissioner's Purchase Order Approval Journal in the amount of $1,017,726.30. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. Resolution increasing appropriations of various general and non general fund accounts. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. Resolution transferring an appropriation within various general fund accounts. Move to adopt. Second. Discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Plechnik. Yes. Commissioner Hammercheck. Yes. Okay, this brings us to our departmental reports portion of our meeting. Randy, utilities. Just a reminder that we have our second collection of the year this Saturday, uh, tire collection from 8 o'clock till 2 o'clock at the fairgrounds. Very good. Thank you, sir. Jason Boyd, county administrator. Just briefly, commissioners, and I'm using my phone as my email. Um, gotcha. Just a brief update with some of the clinics uh, forthcoming at the health district. As we've noted, the past couple of weeks kind of migrating from the larger uh, megapods uh, to some smaller uh, remote uh, opportunities. Encourage everyone to go to the health district's website, but um, got some correspondence this morning, April 29th, the Salvation Army in Painesville. Uh, Walk-ins welcome from 2 to 5. You will need a, a ArmorVax appointment, but walk-ins are welcome, but you still need to use the ArmorVax software. That'll be a, um, a vaccine type of Moderna. Um, on April 30th, the Lake County Engineers Road Department, uh, the Painesville Mosquito Building, which is off of Blackbrook Road, um, as, a, as an opportunity uh, tentative uh, vaccine is Moderna. Um, May the 4th, Painesville Morley Library, the mobile van on Phelps Street. Um, Walk-ins are once again welcome from 2 to 5 o'clock. And I will get this to the clerk to put on our website as well. And uh, May the 15th at Lakeland is another clinic, uh, Lakeland Community College. Um, the vaccine type is to be determined yet on that one. So just a brief update on our vaccine. Numbers are looking better and better. You know, in, in early to mid-April, we saw a little bit of an increase, and that seems to be heading the other way. Uh, we Is it 2 o'clock? Uh, we, will, we will remain red today in the governor's uh, classification systems. We're triggering three indicators, but we're, we're all three indicators are trending in the right direction. Um, so hopefully we'll go orange here sooner than later. So 
Thank you very much. What is our vaccination rate now in Lake County? <sighs> Do you have any I don't have the rate. In, as of last week, Commissioner Hammercheck may recall, we were, we're, we're, we're bouncing around one and three in the state yeah. as far as competitive. I mean, we're, we are doing a phenomenal job getting the vaccine out. Um, I haven't seen the data today that will come out at 2 o'clock, typically on Thursdays when the governor does his presser. I'm sure Ron Graham might have got a, a sneak peek. Um, but we're doing really well. All right, thank Commissioner, you. is that what you're still yeah, hearing? I, I apologize. I also don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but I know we are well above the state average. And Jason is correct. We are one of the top rated counties in the state of Ohio. Correct. Um, pretty much I, uh, it's, it's breaking down to people have either all those who wanted a vaccine have had the opportunity to receive one. I know some folks have been holding out for the Johnson and Johnson. So they're, you know, that availability, as we know, had been, uh, suspended i believe it's back into the inventory but i don't know that the health district has received any allocations or ordered any of that I, I i don't know about the private pharmacies yes but that's that that one's the uh that one's one of the outliers um so yeah it's coming down to a lot of people and they uh make the, the choice issue yeah and we're not we're not alone i spoke to some of my colleagues from northwest ohio all glaze county to southeast ohio and it, it's that it looks like that demand side we've peaked to a point so now it's you know efforts that we are making we being the health district and their partners is, as to going out into the community to some of these hard to hit areas and uh, really plugging away and i i jason boyd editorial i think when the j and j becomes more widely available i think we're going to see just an exponential increase as well i think a lot of people to your point are waiting are waiting on that so we're one of the top three in the state yeah as of last week we were every indicator we were we were doing really really well so and, and good, work. good uh, work again commissioner um just some of the calls uh, january and february when the vaccine was coming out listening to to ron graham and his team the fire chiefs um and Commissioner Hammerchick uses scalable and adaptable. So we went from getting 400 that first week to 5,000, right? Which which requires, I would say, at a megapod. Commissioner, how many folks are working that? 100? Well over 100. Well over 100 folks from our employees to health district to, to paramedics to. Com I know these commissioners went and volunteered a couple times. So now now we're scaling back. Yeah, it's just it's 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 working really well. Clearly, there's hiccups as in any process, but. I was talking to Director Busher last week, and when we have the opportunity to do a hot wash or cold wash, whatever the right term is, and review this, the past 16 or 18 months, um, I think we're going to look back upon this and really and be really proud of how we worked through it. Clearly, there was some, you think about it, a year ago today, what's today, April, we were in the thick of this thing. Yeah. What's going to happen, you know, and to think where we have come uh, locally is, is I'm really proud of the guys and gals who've been out there doing the work so yeah a year ago right now mid to late April everyone was wondering what in the world you know what are we gonna be doing here so and communication was our greatest ally yes and I you know you got to give mayor Morley left but as mayors and managers those those there for a while those were two or three calls a week yes early on and now we're, we're weekly but from coordinating farmers markets to who's having fireworks to who's opening pools or not opening pools that consistent messaging last year i think was very beneficial to the residents so my last thing on behalf of uh, director matis i know he sent out uh, the 2022 uh, preliminary budgets that he does which also include a five-year forecast um, so those are out to all of our elected officials and departments so thank very you good thank you sir okay madam clerk Yes, I just wanted to mention that our next regular commissioner's meeting is Thursday, May 6th, 2021 at 10 a.m. There you go. So we're getting to set your calendar, not your watch, huh? So, okay, thank you. All right, legal. No reports, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. Okay, old business. Do we have any old business coming before this board? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to jump into a couple of questions that are relevant to today's discussion that I was hit with uh, since our last meeting. I'm going to take them in no particular order, but this is how they were thrown to me. There was some uh, discussion when we're talking about the uh, wages of our corrections officers. Uh, the suggestion was put that I should be made aware of and make my colleagues aware of the median wage of the people of Lake County. I appreciate that perspective, but in no way would it make any uh, sense to connect certifications, accreditations with the median wage 
of people in Lake County. I, I, I appreciate that, but if someone is a recognized professional in their field, uh, I, I cannot make that connection. Right. Uh, that's just, it's not going to happen. Um, in fact, our, our wage structure, we are losing corrections officers. They are part of our justice system. They are going to find other forms of gainful employ. There's a great deal of stress. There's a great deal of risk. Uh, they do a tremendous job over there. And I, again, give them high praise for maintaining the standards that need to be achieved and maintained literally on a daily basis. So to that point, that's just not going to happen. Uh, there was a, an allegation of inconsistency and conflicts in some of my statements regarding maintenance. Let me be abundantly clear. Back in the day when the building was commissioned, it was not properly constructed, it was not properly maintained, and we as a board in recent years have taken a very strong role in making sure that, like an old car, I'll, I'll add that caveat, you're taking care of what you've got, and we are making best use, and we are having our internal staff working on things, and I give them praise, our telecommunications firm, our buildings and grounds, and the private contractors they bring in. But when you hear me talk about a corrections officer and maintenance, that term, I apologize if it seems a bit confusing to some, but I'm certainly not indicating that they're on the roof patching holes. When a corrections officer is maintaining the facility, they're maintaining the certifications and the standards that they have to, by law, maintain. That is the context in which I'm talking about our corrections officers and the administration of that facility and our sheriff. And I certainly don't expect the sheriff out there to be washing windows or patching leaks in the, uh, the door frames. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a false argument. And I, I apologize for my frustration, but my filters today are just about shot. Um, so. I think we can put that to bed. There has been some question of why was an administration built? Why was there an administration building built prior to a jail project being entered into? Well, I'm not going to cop out by saying I inherited, I inherited, it did. Ooh. I came into this job. Boy, I'm having a hard time saying inherited. Whew, there you go. After three or four tries. This project when I came into office along with Commissioner Serino and working closely with Commissioner Troy, we reviewed the work product. Uh, I believe Jason Boyd said, we're gonna pump the brakes. There was, a, there was a pause. We did review the merits. There were a number of buildings, for example, our county engineer, their building, you wanna talk about end of service life? It was the barracks for the army personnel manning the old Nike site. Now there are some people reviewing this who are wondering, what the heck is he talking about? Yeah, that was the air defense system that was actually located throughout our country uh, to be able to uh, deal with the Soviet Union. Yes, we had a Nike, actually two Nike sites here, and that was the barracks that was for the county engineer. The building was inadequate. It was at the end of its service life. I believe we're using it now as a temporary warming shelter uh, for the homeless in an emergency, uh, the code blue criteria. But for our county engineer and their staff, this just wasn't a good fit. That's just one example. Our utilities would be another. But uh, it had to do with consolidation. It also had to, can do, had, had to do with flow of information. You know, one of the big things we talk about is uh, economic development and flow. Well, if you've got developers that have to uh, do a traveling road show, it's just not going to happen. You, you know, if it's one-stop shopping or you're at one complex where you can hit soil and water, engineer, building department, all of those, the consolidation made sense. But I'm proud to say that in that review, we went from an estimated 43 million to an out-the-door price of 30 million. And I think we came in well under 30 million, but I certainly wouldn't want to be accused of understating the cost of this new facility. So to the jail discussion, that was also a very hot topic. It has been, as you can see by our candor here today, it has been an ongoing discussion and it has been an ongoing review. So that is why the administration building was constructed rather than a jail. Uh, there's been some talk about the Justice Center and the scoffing of, well, let's see how well that worked in Cleveland. A bad example is still an example. I think we have given numerous examples of successfully employing 
proper, innovative, and also time-proven techniques, strategies, programs uh, in our justice system that are, again, leaders in the state of Ohio. I, again, give high praise to our courts. I give high praise to our sheriff and the corrections officers and every member of that justice system all the way through right down to the law library. And I'm certainly not trying to minimize the importance of the law library. Our clerk of courts is here with us today, and she has been a trooper and sat through this along with Becky Lynch, our uh, county recorder. So, you know, you, you've got a true team effort here of people that are making sure that all aspects of our justice system are helped out and adhered to. Our public defender and our prosecutor's office, innovative and supportive of each other. Uh, those are the kind of things that define what justice is. When you can have your prosecutor and your public defender working together for the good of the community, that's a real testament to the uh, quality and the integrity of the services being provided. So that checked off all my boxes under old business. So if we have no other old business. Mr. President. Please, sir. I actually do have old business related to yours, which I think shows how matters of opinion can differ. But since the last commissioner's meeting, I had a resident reach out with the concern that our correctional officers in the jail are underpaid and that we're losing officers to other facilities as a result and asked if we might be able to just get a, a real back pocket comparison of what our corrections officers are paid vis-a-vis uh, -vis other corrections officers in jail. So if we could have our clerk's office perhaps talk with the sheriff just to get a general sense of what the pay scale and numbers are so that we can give a, a more thorough response when people say, I think they're overpaid, as you've heard, or underpaid, as I've heard, within the same week. Uh, I think it would be helpful to have those exact numbers to respond with. Thank you, sir. Fair, fair question. Okay, uh, moving on to new business. Do we have any new business? Okay, I'm going to throw a little, I'm going to do a little teaser here. There's going to be, uh, is Mr. Lima still with us, or did he? Oh, nuts. This one was going to be a good one for Mr. Lima, but there is going to be a very interesting announcement coming out about a joint project that has been uh, quite a long time in the making. A great deal of diligence has been put into it. It's part of our justice system. It's going to be a joint venture with our public defender, our clerk of courts, and our commissioner's office. Uh, a lot of this started, and I'm, I'm going to give a further teaser or begin the conversation, and I'm going to say Bishop Coffey's name. So there, if that's not enough of a, a teaser there, how, how's that? Uh, that, that, that? There will be an official announcement coming out, but we've got some good things coming. And uh, again, the definition of the justice system. Okay, moving on to our second public comment portion. Do we have anyone in our audience wishing to address this board? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting lots of news. Jason Poy, do we have any electronic submissions of questions or comments? We do not, indicating none. Thank you, sir. Okay, and at this point, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Second. And discussion. None being heard. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Pletchney. Yes. Commissioner Hammerton. Yes. Thank you. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs> That's great.